we have several council members flying in from other meetings right now, so uh, we will be settling in for the next minute or two. But in the meantime, I will invite the clerk to please call the roll. Council maybe. Council member Flaherty? Yes, we're here. <laughs> Rosa Barker? Here. Sandberg? Here. Piedmont Smith? Here. Scambaluri? Here. Rallo? Here. Smith? Here. And Volin? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it is Wednesday, January 18th, and this is a regular session of the Bloomington Common Council. The agenda is as follows. We'll begin with approval of minutes. We have five sets to approve this evening. We'll then move into reports um, from council members, and we will have a council statement at that point um, on the recent events in Bloomington. And I believe we have a report from the mayor and city offices, okay? Um, we'll then go into reports from council committees, and then we will have our first period of public comment um, for items not on the agenda, not otherwise on the agenda. We'll then move into appointments to boards and commissions. We will have both appointments of council members there uh, and appointments, uh, and I believe, some appointments of citizen members of boards and commissions. We will then go into legislation for second readings and resolutions. First will be resolution 23-01, a resolution seeking an end to the United States economic, commercial, and financial embargo against Cuba. Then we'll move to resolution 2302, a resolution of the Common Council of the City of Bloomington adopting Indiana Code 523 for use as an alternative, for use as an alternative procurement method. We will then move to Appropriation Ordinance 2206, an ordinance appropriating the proceeds of the City of Bloomington, Indiana, general revenue annual appropriation bonds of 2022 together with all investment earnings thereon for the purpose of providing funds to be applied to the costs of certain capital improvements for public safety facilities and paying miscellaneous costs in connection with the foregoing and the issuance of said bonds and sale thereof and approving an agreement of the Bloomington Redevelopment Commission to purchase certain property. We'll then move into legislation for first readings. Included there is Ordinance 2301, to amend the City of Bloomington zoning maps by rezoning 0.57 acre, acres of property from mixed use neighborhood scale to mixed use medium scale regarding 300, 302, and 314 West 1st Street. St. Real Estate LLC is the petitioner. We'll then move into our second period of public comment. We'll take up matters of council schedule and then we'll adjourn. So, with that, Let's move into approval of our minutes. Madam President, I move that the uh, minutes for the Bloomington Common Council for the meetings of April 14th, 2021 special session, September 8th, 2021 special session, October 27th, 2021 special session, November 3rd, 2021 regular session, and the minutes of uh, November 17th, 2021 regular session be approved. Second. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Those minutes are approved. Okay. Next, we'll move into council member reports. I'd like to begin um, with a council statement in response to the January 11th racially motivated attack here in Bloomington. On January 11th, 2023, we learned of the racially motivated attack against an Asian American woman on one of our city buses. We condemn this crime unequivocally. Like many of our neighbors and colleagues, we are shocked by this incident, and we are deeply concerned about a climate in which some of our residents feel unsafe. We stand by the Common Council Resolution 20-06, denouncing and condemning white nationalism and white supremacy which we adopted unanimously on May 6, 2020, initiated and sponsored by Council Member Sims and co-sponsored by all nine council members, this resolution condemns white nationalism, white supremacy, bigotry, racism, and hatred while upholding values of equity, inclusivity, respect, and kindness. Together, as members of the Bloomington Common Council, we condemn racism, the violence it begets, 
and the ignorance and fear on which it is based. We affirm our support for the Asian and Asian American community here and for all persons of color. We are determined to lead with integrity and to do all we can as elected officials to ensure that Bloomington truly reflects the diversity, equity, and inclusiveness that we value so deeply. City of Bloomington Common Council. Is there a motion? Madam President, I move that the statement that you uh, have just read uh, be released on behalf of the council. Second. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. And if the clerk would please include that in the meeting summary, we would be grateful. So let's now move to council member reports. I'll start on my far left, Council Member Volan. No report. Council Member Smith. No report tonight, thank you. Council Member Rollo. I have no report either, thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith. No report. Council Member Sandberg. Just to say that Council Member Rollo and myself will have our monthly constituent meeting on Saturday the 21st, starting at 10, and that Zoom link should be on the City Council's calendar, thank you. Councilmember Rosenbarger? No report, thank you. And Councilmember Flaherty? Uh, yes, similarly, uh, I have a constituent meeting uh, next Monday. Normally I host those on the third Monday, but this month we are celebrating the um, Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, so it will be Monday, um, uh, <laughs> January 23rd uh, at 5.30 p.m. via Zoom. You can find those um, details for the meeting at the bloomington.in.gov uh, council, uh, the city council's uh, calendar on that page. Thank you. Thank you, and I have no report this evening. So, With that, let's move to the mayor and city offices. I believe we have Deputy Mayor Carmichael with us. Yes, Deputy Mayor Mary Catherine Carmichael. Good evening, everybody. Nice to be with you this evening. Um, <clears throat> much along the lines of the statement that you read, I'd like to take an opportunity to enter into the record a statement that uh, Mayor Hamilton offered uh, last week uh, on the same topic. Following the brutal attack of a member of our community, I want to state categorically that here in the city of Bloomington, we deplore any form of racism or discrimination, especially hate-based violence. This behavior is not acceptable and will be dealt with accordingly. I appreciate the quick response of a witness to the crime who helped police locate and identify the suspect, along with the Bloomington Police Department and the Indiana University Community of Care for embracing the victim and providing appropriate support as she goes through this terrible ordeal. We know when a racially motivated incident like this resonates throughout the community, it can leave us feeling less safe. We stand with the Asian community and all who feel threatened by this event. Our staff will continue to do all we can for the victim and the larger community. Bloomington is a relatively safe place, but we are not immune to issues with which our entire nation is dealing. This senseless incident is a reminder that we should all look out for each other, be aware of our surroundings, and seek to combat racism and prejudice in all its forms wherever and whenever we encounter it. Thank you. Okay. With that, we'll come back to council for any reports from council committees. Seeing none, we'll come to our first period of public comment. There's 20 minutes allocated for this. This is for uh, items that are not currently on the agenda for this evening. So here in chambers, if you would please approach the podium and sign in, Mr. Lucas, if you could make our announcement on Zoom, please. Yes, if there are members of the public on Zoom that would like to comment now, please use the raise hand feature to let us know. You can find that in your control bar under the reactions tab or the control uh, reaction, reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to comment and we will recognize you that way. And so here in chambers, do we have planning to make comment to? No, no takers on Zoom at the moment. Okay. Right. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's plan on five minutes, please. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> wow, thank you so much. My name is David Wolf Bender, Director of City Relations, Indiana University Student Government. Um, I have a statement on, uh, on behalf of our executive branch regarding the events of the recent weeks. 
Bloomington and Indiana University should always be a place for all. Unfortunately, the events of the last week suggest our communities have a long way to go to achieve that promise. The racially motivated, heartless attack on an Asian student at Indiana University is a harsh reminder that hatred exists in our communities. This act was unprovoked and targeted. Public transportation is a ubiquitous need for students in our city. Our bus system unlocks a student's ability to get involved in our city's off-campus events, work or shop at local businesses, and volunteer with city nonprofits. Public transportation can tie our on-campus and off-campus communities together, and it promotes the social fabric between students and non-students in our city. Nobody should ever be scared to get on a Bloomington bus. This unfortunately is not the first attack of its kind around the country or in our community. At the onset of COVID-19 in January 2020, anti-Asian hatred started to spread at alarming rates. The March 2021 murder of eight people in Atlanta, most of whom were Asian women, was one of the 95 anti-Asian hate crimes in the first three months of 2021. IU's Asian Culture Center also rightfully drew attention to two past incidents in and near our communities since 1999. In its statement last week, the Asian Culture Center asked the people of Bloomington and IU to condemn racial violence against Asian communities. Unequivocally, we do. We stand with IU's Asian students, faculty, and staff, as well as Bloomington's Asian residents. In addition to this event, a brave IU student posted a now viral video following his experience, or describing his experience, of being bullied and harassed as a trans student at IU. In an interview with, local with a local television station, the student told a reporter he transferred to IU in part of the support of, in the part of the supportive community he saw the school provide to its, L to its LGBTQ plus students. But our community let him down. It only took a few months for this student to experience harassment in our community. We want to acknowledge the bravery of the student who came forward to tell his story. It is now on the rest of us to enact new policies, change minds, and be there for friends and colleagues, all with the goal of stamping out transphobia and all form of hate in our community. The IU Student Government Executive Branch wholly condemns this repugnant harassment and will always stand behind the LGBTQ plus students at IU and in Bloomington. We long for a day when no student or community member faces harassment because of who they are. No person should ever feel unsafe on this campus or in this city, no matter their ethnicity, race, sexual orientation, gender, or religion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Benner. Okay. Mr. Lucas, has anyone appeared on Zoom? No, I don't believe so. Okay, thank you. Welcome. If you would, please share your name for the record, and then you'll have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Bender, for that uh, very thoughtful and uh, excellent public statement. Uh, good evening, Council. Eric Spoonmore, President of the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. Over 80% of our members are small, locally owned enterprises. We also partner with our public school corporations, numerous nonprofit organizations, institutions of higher education, local government, and many large corporate employers here in the Bloomington area. We believe that membership in the chamber is a statement that you care about our community and you want Bloomington to thrive for generations to come. In other words, we recognize that our businesses and employers are instrumental to achieving the high quality of life that our residents deserve here. And so the quality of life we all want is dependent upon our residents and visitors feeling safe in our community. And when I say safe, I don't mean relatively safe. We need people to feel very safe. And I know you're aware of this, and we've heard multiple statements tonight already, but we've experienced a disturbing number of violent crimes over the past several months and weeks, rapes, stabbings, shootings, arson, murders, attempted murders, and broad daylight. These things simply cannot be tolerated by a community under any circumstance. And ensuring the safety of the public is local government's most fundamental 
role. It comes before everything else. I also want to let you know that too many businesses in our community are having to commit substantial resources to protect their personal safety and to protect their property from damage related to vandalism and other illicit behaviors that are contributing to a general degradation of the quality of place here in Bloomington. The Chamber of Commerce even keeps our front doors locked during business hours because we have experienced too many situations that have put our staff and property at risk of harm. You know, it's really sad to me that a Chamber of Commerce of all places has to keep the doors locked so that our staff feel safe. And we're not the only enterprises taking these measures. Numerous businesses or having to hire private security services. They're installing security doors and expensive intercom systems and surveillance cameras to the tune of tens of thousands of dollars. And the businesses aren't just eating these costs. At the end of the day, they have to pass the cost on to the customers. They don't want to do that. That's the only way they can stay in business. So this is not a good situation, especially considering the 51% increase in local income tax that workers are all now paying largely to address public safety. And so I don't know all the answers for addressing the very significant concerns that we at the chamber hear about perceived and actual safety in the community. But I think we clearly need to look into some new crime prevention strategies. And in the meantime, my first suggestion would be to employ the number of professional police officers that we need to provide effective public safety services. We used to have them. And I don't know what happened to them. I don't know where they all went. Not too long ago, we had over 100 sworn officers. And now we have somewhere around 80, and we need to make progress on getting back to where we were. I hear that all the time. And then another suggestion. I appreciate the weekly reports on the number of city employees who have COVID. Appreciate that. I know there's a lot of diligent record keeping with that data and the staff works to distribute that information to the public very reliably each week. And so I'd also be interested in using that same model to generate a detailed weekly report that shows the progress we're making on hiring police officers to address the current shortage that we have. So I cannot emphasize this enough that the business community is not just concerned. We are gravely concerned that we do not have enough employed police officers protecting the safety of our community. And then finally, I'd also just suggest more overall police visibility, day and night, especially in the high traffic pedestrian areas. I'm sure there are community policing strategies that numerous other communities have used, and they do this effectively. There are a lot of theories about crime deterrence, but I think the most progressive criminology experts would even generally agree that there is no better deterrent to violent criminal behavior than knowing you will get caught in the act of doing it. It's so let's do everything we can to prevent these kinds of reprehensible violent crimes that occurred just last week in this city. We want people to use public transportation and we want people to visit our city, to spend their dollars here to support our businesses. And if we want residents to enjoy our downtown and parks and Thank facilities you, with Smith their Moore. families, they need to feel safe when engaging in these activities. Please keep public safety a primary you, priority and your number one priority. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Spoonmore. So, any comments on, any commenters on Zoom? Okay, thank you. Here in Chambers, welcome. If you would, please share your name for the record and then you'll have five minutes. Good evening. My name is Bradley Rushton. I am an employee with the City of Bloomington. I'm the current serving president for Ask Me 2487. As if you folks don't have enough to think about, uh, there is an aspect. Mm -hmm. Can you pull the microphone just a little oh, closer? I'm terribly sorry. Is that Thank better? You. Better. Okay. Uh, I'd like to shed a light on some uh, aspects that are currently underway that uh, is going to require your attention. Uh, as it stands right now uh, with the City Fleet Maintenance Department, we currently have five technicians, five. 
we currently have numbered 649 pieces of equipment with the city. There is a website called governmentfleet.com that breaks the uh, ratio of vehicles that needs to be serviced by technician. There is an a, uh, algorithm that they utilize for uh, counties and cities and the ratio they put is 55 to 60 to one. We're currently at 130 to one. We cannot keep up with the influx of repairs. We have lost employees. We can't get new ones. And this is directly correlated with public safety. We need something to happen. We've talked to, we are blue in the face with our, our public works director. No fault of his, I don't know what's going on, it's beyond my pay grade. But if we can't keep these vehicles in the line of service with the fire department, police department, and other aspects of services that the city demands, we are in a world of hurt. I don't know how to express it any clearer. And as always, I appreciate your time. And if I can be of any assistance to elaborate any further on any of this subject, please feel free to contact me. I am at your service. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Russian. <coughs> Commenters on Zoom? Yes, uh, we have Renee Miller. Ms. Miller, welcome. Please confirm your name for the record, and then you'll have five minutes. Hi, Renee Miller. Um, I'm wanting to speak about safety or lack of safety in um, Bloomington. Um, we have a systemic classism issue in Bloomington. We know the cost of living continues to rise. And so when we see many of the crimes that are occurring, it's because people are desperate, they um, need help, and we're not helping them to the extent that they need help. Um, yes, we have racism and homophobia and xenophobia, um, et cetera, that make us unsafe also. But when we, uh, uh, the CAPS Commission, the Safety Commission, um, did a survey asking people what is safety to them, their number one answer was having a house and a roof over their head. And when we don't have people that have roofs over their head, those are the people that are feeling unsafe and are and are feeling desperate and many times um, doing things that they need to do to survive. So I think we need to continue to look at that and help those that um, don't have as much as some of the rest of us do. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Additional comments here in chambers or on Zoom? Seeing none, that'll conclude our first period of public comment. We'll have a second comment, period of comment toward the end of the meeting. Okay. With that, let's move into appointments to boards and commissions. We'll be taking this in two parts. Um, first, uh, appointments of council members to various boards and commissions, and then appointments of citizen members of various boards and commissions. So I would ask, what is the will of the council? Do you wish to treat council member appointments as a slate, or do you wish to take them individually? I hear one slate. Slate, 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 okay. With that, I'll just read, and please treat this as a motion. I, I recommend the move the following appointments um, of our council members. To the Citizens Advisory Committee, Community Development Block Grants for Social Services, Council Member Smith, for Physical Improvements, Council Member Rosenbarger. To the Downtown Bloomington Inc. Board, Council Member Scambaluri. To the Economic Development Commission for the City, Council Member Flaherty. To the Economic Development Commission for the County, Council Member Sandberg. To the Parking Commission, Council Member Volan. To the Food and Beverage Tax Advisory Commission, Council Member Volan to the Public Safety Local Income Tax Committee. There are four members here, Council Member Piedmont Smith, Council Member Rollo, Council Member Sandberg, and Council Member Sims. To the Plan Commission, Council Member Smith. To the Solid Waste Management District, Council Member Piedmont Smith. 
to the Board of the Urban Enterprise Association, Council Member Rosenbarger, to the Environmental Resources Advisory Council, Council Member Rollo, to the Utility Service Board, Council Member Sims, to the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation Board, Council Member Scambaluri, to the Bloomington Commission on Sustainability, Council Member Flaherty, and to the Metropolitan Planning Organization, Council Member Volan. Okay. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you all very much. Are there any additional appointments to boards and commissions? I know that several of our interview committees have been at work. Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. I will also propose uh, these reappointments um, as a slate, but if anybody would like for any of the individuals to be removed in a separate question, I'm open to that um, by way of an amendment <coughs> uh, to the motion. But with that, uh, on behalf of interview committee B, uh, I would like to move the re reappointment of the following uh, members to boards and commissions. Ann Edmonds to seat C1 of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Commission. Landry Culp to seat C4 of the Commission on the Status of Women. Kamala Brown Sparks to seat C6 of the Community Advisory and Public Safety Commission. Renee Miller to seat C9 of the Community Advisory and Public Safety Commission. Donald Eggert to seat C5 of the Environmental Commission. Greg Alexander to seat C5 of the Traffic Commission. And Amanda Burnham to seat C2 of the Utilities Service Board. All those in favor of those nominations, please indicate by saying aye. Those appointments, I should say. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Yes, I am opposed. Mr. Rollo? Mm -hmm. And are there any abstentions? So, Madam Clerk, is there a particular way to record that? Sure. Given that we have had both eyes on names. A call for a roll call names. vote? Would you a roll call vote would be nice. Okay. Let's move to a roll call vote then for those nominations. So, Madam Clerk, if you would, please call the roll. Yes, Council Member Flaherty. Yes. Rosenbarger. Yes. Sandberg. Abstain. Piedmont-Smith? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Rallo? No. Smith? Yes. And Volin? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. That is 611, and that passes. Thank you, Council Member Flaherty. Are there additional appointments to boards and commissions? Seeing none, let's move into legislation for second readings and resolutions. Madam President, I move that resolution 2301 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Will the clerk please read? Resolution 2301, resolution seeking an end to the United States economic, commercial, and financial embargo against Cuba. The synopsis is as follows. This resolution is co-sponsored by Council Members Rallo and Sandberg. It calls for the end of the United States embargo against Cuba and directs the city clerk to send copies of the resolution to the Indiana Congressional Delegation and the President of the United States. Oh, I'm sorry. I would like to move adoption. Second. Thank you. Sponsors, Council Members Rollo and Sandberg, would either of you like to comment? I will defer to uh, Council Member Rollo. I would like to read the uh, resolution. Please do. We'll just take a moment, and I think that it indicates, explains um, why we should support this policy. Uh, this is Resolution 2301. It's a resolution seeking an end to the United States economic, commercial, and financial embargo against Cuba. Whereas in 1962, President John F. Kennedy proclaimed an embargo on trade between the United States and Cuba, which remains in place today. And whereas the U.S. embargo against Cuba continues to inflict hardship on the people of Cuba by creating shortages of food, medicines, and financial and trade opportunities. 
And whereas in 1998, the city of Bloomington adopted resolution 9819 to support the development of a sister city relation between the citizens of Bloomington and Santa Clara, Cuba, which was visited by three city council members, Hopkins, Pizzo, and Gall, shortly after. And whereas on December 17, 2014, US President Barack Obama and Cuban President Raul Castro announced a new era of relations between the two countries and agreed to reestablish diplomatic relations with each country's respective embassy reopening the following year. And whereas restrictions on trade and travel to Cuba, Cuba were more severely restricted under the Trump administration, including cessation of flights from the US to Santa Clara, and whereas the formerly waived Title III of the 1996 Helms-Burton Act went into effect under President Donald Trump, as did designation of Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism, creating devastating results for Cubans and undermining trade between Cuba and other sovereign nations. And whereas over the last 30 years, the United Nations General Assembly has repeatedly called for an end to the economic, commercial, and financial embargo imposed by the US against Cuba, most recently in November 2022, through a vote to condemn the embargo, which received a vote of 185 countries supporting the condemnation, uh, two countries opposing it, the US and Israel, and two countries abstaining, Brazil and Ukraine. And whereas in July uh, 12, 2021 statement, President Joseph Biden said he stood with the Cuban people as they protested the Cuban regime, yet has do not done all he could to reduce their suffering. And whereas the majority of the people of the United States believe the embargo is ineffective, inhumane, and in violation of the US laws and international conventions, and whereas trade and cultural exchanges between the US and Cuba are mutually beneficial to both countries in music, art, tourism, healthcare, education, and biotechnological and medical research, and whereas resolutions calling for an end to the embargo have been adopted by Richmond, Oakland, Berkeley, and Sacramento, California, Seattle, Washington, Helena, uh, Helena uh, Montana, Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota, Detroit, Michigan, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Brookline, Massachusetts, and Hartford, Connecticut. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Bloomington, Monroe County, Indiana, that the City of Bloomington hereby calls for an immediate end to the United States economic and commercial and financial embargo against Cuba, including restrictions on travel to Cuba by U.S. citizens and removal of Cuba from the list of state sponsors of terrorism. And Section 2, the City of Bloomington urges President Biden to renew negotiations with the Cuban government as initiated past presidents to build a new cooperative relationship between the United States and Cuba. And section three, the city clerk shall send a copy of this resolution duly adopted to the Indiana congressional delegation and president of the United States. So this resolution has been um, a, a bit of a long time in coming. Uh, Cuba Amistad of uh, Bloomington has been supporting it for um, many, many months and, and looking for action on this. Um, as is said in the resolution, this is something that uh, President Biden has pledged, pledged to reverse the Trump era uh, restrictions. I guess there are some 234 of them sanctions. Um, and I would just add, like to add that the, the people of Cuba are suffering tremendously under these sanctions. And um, it, it just hardens resolve of people um, to have such an, an aggressive policy. Better to engage them, better to have good relations and, um, and move forward. So. Um, with that, I'd like to um, ask the uh, council president if we could allow members of Cuban Amistad to, uh, to make remarks at this time. Um, we can treat that as public comment, if you're agreeable. Um, are there questions from council first? Council member Piedmont Smith. Um, yes, I, uh, I have a couple of questions and I actually wonder <clears throat> if, um, members of Cuba Amistad might be the ones who have the answers, but I can ask them now and then maybe ask again at another time. At a second time? Oh. Why, don't we try, why don't we do that? That can help shape comments. Okay. So, so first of all, um, uh, there are some sanctions in this um, uh, CRS, U.S. Cuba policy overview that was in our packet that um, it seems to me uh, 
I, I would not want to, to waive. Um, the, in particular, transactions with the Cuban military are listed, and um, so I, I have some questions about if we uh, vote um, in favor of uh, ending the embargo, does that also indicate our support for ending all sanctions? Because I feel like some of them, there are also sanctions um, on certain, you know, financial, uh, economic sanctions on certain members of the Cuban government, uh, which of course is an oppressive regime, so I wouldn't want to waive those as well or ask the government to, the U.S. government to, to get rid of those. So, so that's a, a question of, of specific sanctions versus uh, support for this resolution that calls an end to the embargo. Did the sponsors wish to respond, or do we want to hold till public comment? Well, let's wait till public comment, okay. unless Councilmember Sandberg has anything. No, this is largely resident-driven, uh, brought to us by Cubanistat, and so I very much want to hear from them as to their rationale as to why they have been uh, you know, seeking us to, um, to pass this uh, resolution. Councilmember Piedmont Smith, did you have an additional question? Or? Yes. Okay. So my other question is uh, with, in the text itself, um, the third to the last whereas clause says the majority of the people of the United States believe the embargo is ineffective, inhumane, and in violation of U.S. laws and international conventions. And there's no footnote here, so I'd like to know where that information comes from. Uh, well, perhaps the uh, Cuban, Cuban Masnad may, may add, but I understand there was a poll taken I uh, can't remember the date, but it, it was by the Atlantic Council, which found that 56% of respondents in the U.S. favor changing U.S. policy toward Cuba, uh, and 63% of adults living in Florida uh, uh, approve of normalizing relations. So, uh, but I could, um, I think there were, there were other polls as well, and perhaps that poll was in 2014. I'm sorry, who conducted that poll? Council the Atlantic Monroe? Council. The Atlantic Council. Oh, thank you. Okay. And are there additional questions before we go to public comment? I'm thinking that that might be the time for questions. It may be. So, yeah, why, why don't, don't we present it? Yeah, why don't we go to public comment and, and treat this? Yeah. Okay. If you would, please state your name for the record. And if you like, any affiliation with Cubamistad, if you like. Um, and then you will have, how many people plan to speak? Okay. Just two. Okay. Three. Three. Oh, three. Okay. oh good. Okay. Frank's going to speak too. That's good. Let's okay. take up to five minutes each. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. I'm Bess Lee. And um, I'm speaking on behalf of Cubamistad and also um, two other experiences I had in, in Cuba. And I hope this might answer some of what um, Isabel's asking. But first of all, I wanted to say um, I hope that you all will go on a sister city visit because things are opening up again. And to go with Cindy, who is an amazing organizer, and to actually see the people and what is happening in Cuba. I want to paraphrase what uh, Ralph Warnock said in his fantastic Senate acceptance speech to know the people, to love the people is to know the people, and to know the people is to be with the people. So it's really hard to describe the devastation of the embargo. I wished I had videos to show you what the economic embargo is doing to the citizens of Cuba, but I'm gonna sum up just with my anecdotal experience. I've been there three times. The first two times I went with people to people which is a wonderful organization. And um, the first time I went, Donald Trump had just been elected two weeks earlier and Castro died that week. It was an amazing time to be in Cuba. And the Cuban people were so excited that there was gonna be a breakthrough because Obama had started to ch shift and change some of the policies. I cannot tell you what it was like to talk to the Cuban, they were like, Finally, 60 years later, as one man said to me, treat us like you did Vietnam. You have not locked Vietnam out of the world economy, but we have been locked out for over 60 years. Let us in, you were, you were the economic leaders, let us in. So the, the thrilling excitement was there, 
And two years later, I went back with people to people. I gotta say what I got to do. I got to teach art to 100 people, age seven to 95. It was so much fun. But um, things were already shifting down under the Trump administration. And the fear and the sadness and the hopes that were, it was like watching their hopes dashed again, because you, you might know that in the 90s, there was such a, a change after our um, peacemaking with Russia that they lost so many food resources that their country lost 30% of its body weight in the 90s. It's unbelievable. And we don't know any of that. So I just want to say um, what a mystery Cuba is, it is as close to, uh, to our country as Indianapolis is from us, they have the highest literacy rate in the world, and they have some of the most amazing medical research coming out of the country, things that we don't even know about. They have the best insulin right now on the planet. They have developed it, but we don't even know anything about that um, because we hear nothing about Cuba because of the embargo. Um, I guess I'm gonna end it with uh, I hope it would be so great. What a bonding experience for you all. We will be going back with Cindy to Cuba with Cubamistad. To have a sister city anywhere is amazing, but especially in Cuba, I think you all should go on the next trip. You know, you come back such good friends after that because it's so wonderful. Now, the meat and potatoes of what um, politically, I mean, I, I'll tell you what I've learned after being there. The embargo, for instance, if a, um, a vessel goes to Cuba to trade. That actual vessel cannot make port in the United States for a year. That's part of the embargo. So it is just unbelievable that how they are just almost isolated on a mountaintop. Think about we trade with China. We trade with everybody except maybe North Korea. And they are our neighbor. They, the people are longing to be uh, united, and you know what will happen, things will definitely change. It will just be the way it is. Things will really improve because the people will have consistent good food and oil, that's another big one, and um, being included in the world economy. That's why there was that vote with the UN where only uh, United States and Israel and everybody else voted for Cuba. So I'm gonna let Cindy take over, but thank you, Councilman Sandberg and Rallo for having held on to this, because I think we started, you all had so much going on. We finally got on your list tonight, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Lee. And who do we have next? Welcome. Um, I'm Cynthia Roberts, and I'm uh, probably a, a founding member of Kubamistad, uh, which was back in the days of um, Jack Hopkins and uh, Anthony Pizzo, and I'm appreciate best your uh, invitation because that was the first thing I was going to say. It's been a long time since council members have gone and we appreciate the opportunity to share with you our concerns. Um, I kind of read through and when you get down to maybe the seventh whereas it talks about the Helms Burton and then the uh, designation of Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism. Um, that's had uh, such an impact that the migration out of Cuba has increased um, drastically. And um, the U.S. and Cuba do have migratory accords, and because the embassy was not staffed, the U.S. did not fulfill their part of the agreement on that. And so that's caused that problem. They are just now starting to make some um, headway on that. And um, Chris Dodds has now been uh, designated as a special envoy to Cuba, which um, the folks who are really in the know, there's a William Leo Grand who's at the American University who is an expert on Latin America, and um, he states that um, the very first step that should be made is to remove Cuba from the state sponsors of terrorism, and quote, it's a designation that had no factual or legal basis, and so, um, even the Secretary of State has a hard time explaining why, why it's in position. Um, and then he went on to say that prospects for significant improvement are better now than any time since Biden took office. So that's encouraging to have that at this time. A um, Couple of other items. Um, the mention um, of the hardships imposed by the embargo, uh, despite this, 
Cuba developed a lung um, vaccine and um, also a treatment for diabetes. But regarding this lung vaccine, there is a fellow, Kelvin Lee, who was at Roswell Park um, in one of the eastern states. I think it's in New York. But um, they did, uh, they were able to get the um, research from Cuba to help develop this, and he works in immunology. He is now on the faculty at IUPUI and director of the Cancer Center. So I sent him a little email. I had communicated with him once before, and um, he did respond. I was pleased. I just did this yesterday, and I thought, he's a busy man. He's not going to respond. But um, he says, and this is mostly quote, um, good to hear about the resolution. The short answer is all such things are hindered by blockade. So the research into this medical, biotechnical, immunological uh, advancements. Uh, the question I had posed to him was, were there any new advancements that he could share with, uh, on Cuba with their biotech and medical science? Um, he said, essentially, Cuban scientists cannot buy any significant reagents or equipment made in the US, and the US it being a very large part of the world's um, scientific resources. So they had been, prior to the state sponsors of terrorism, able to get these from some distance companies, but his comment on that was that the shipping took such a long time, and I'm not even sure with the designation of um, Cuba as a, a state sponsor of terrorism that that would um, be allowed. Um, and then um, I just want to refer people to our uh, website, which is um, kubamistad.wordpress.com, because we have an archive. Rather than sharing, I wanted to share some of the things that we've done here uh, to bring Cuba closer to those that haven't been able to go. And um, like Beth said, it is um, such a great opportunity. I even talked to Proximity Cuba, which is part of the responsible and ethical Cuba travel group. Uh, about the possibility of organizing a visit, um, sort of specifically for the council, but you know, some Kumemistan members and public may want to go as well. So, uh, thank you very much, and I think um, someone is, did I identify myself properly? Thank okay. you, Ms. Robertson. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, and I think we had one additional comment in chambers, and while you're coming forward, Mr. Lucas, if you want to make an announcement on Zoom, please. Yes, if there are members of the public on Zoom that would like to comment on this item, please use the raise hand feature to let us know. You can find that raise hand button in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. Thank you. Welcome, if you would state your name for the record and then you'll have five minutes. Yeah, hi, I'm Frank Marshleck um, from the uh, Department of Geography at IU and the Center for Systems Collaboration Change. Um, but I uh, started going to Cuba in 2003, and I decided to do a PhD dissertation on the reform process in Cuba. Uh, and I want to bring your attention to your attention that the reform process has been very significant, but I'm sure that nobody here has heard very much about it. Uh, there have been a lot of economic reforms and social reforms. And socially, uh, you can feel the difference. I've gone to Cuba twice a year since 2003 all the way to the pandemic, and I'm going again in, uh, in February to, to do more research. Um, but you can feel the difference. When, I f when we first started going there, there was a lot of police in the tourist areas. They're gone now. You don't, you don't really see them. You did have the feeling that they were keeping an eye on some Cubans and their interactions with tourists. Now, there's no issues like that. It's disappeared. Uh, the, the economic reforms have been quite significant. They've opened up the private sector. So you can open up your own business now. Um, for like here, you just have to purchase a license. They're quite cheap. So it's, it's not, uh, not impossible despite the uh, widespread poverty. Um, so the thing is, is that the economic embargo is really just the tip of the iceberg, as Cindy said. Um, this uh, being on the state-sponsored terrorism list, 
It has no basis whatsoever. Cuba is not involved in any sort of international or domestic terrorism. The government is not involved in terrorism. How they contrive this, I, I really can't imagine. Um, so, of course, that was the Trump administration that imposed it. Um, so, the other thing is, is that the United States government, well, the CIA, um, since early in the, rev in the revolution, had backed uh, Cuban exile groups that have committed terrorism, terrorist acts, including the, the downing of a, a Cuban airliner in the 1970s, for example, as well as other sorts of economic sabotage and so forth. Um, so I'm not sure who should be on the, on the state-sponsored terrorist list here. Uh, but Cuba is sending medical brigades around the world and offers to send doctors uh, to the United States, such as after Hurricane Katrina and other hurricanes and so forth, which the United States always rejects, of course, and actually try to turn the tables and say, well, medical doctors are actually forced labor. They're forced to do these things. It's not the case. You can talk to doctors and they'll tell you otherwise. Um, so things have changed in Cuba. The economy's opened up. Uh, surveillance of the population has diminished. There are still restrictions on starting large-scale organizations. Um, so, and they must be approved by the government. But with the kind of looming threat from the United States always being omnipresent in Cuba, you can almost understand that the government becomes rather paranoid about this. And the United States actually funds Cubans uh, to uh, organize opposition. They pay them. And these are, these are documented facts that I'm talking about. Uh, so I'm trying to say that Cuba is not really a threat. Uh, they have loosened up dramatically. And I'm sure, as uh, the two uh, uh, ladies who have just spoke, uh, if you would come on down with Cuba Amistad, you'll be amazed how open it actually is. Uh, so now the real trouble, the real suffering by the Cuban people is, is, is um, from the uh, economic embargo. The economic embargo, according to the UN, costs Cuba in today's money 2.1 billion dollars a year for a country of 11 million people. It's a couple of hundred dollars per person per year, but it, it's quite a bit. Um, so so that, that's all I have to say. The, the economic uh, uh, embargo is their chief problem down there for the Cuban people themselves. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Thank you. So, additional comment here in chambers or on Zoom? <clears throat> on Zoom, we do have Greg Alexander. Okay. Mr. Alexander? Hi. Welcome. Please confirm your name for the record, and then you'll have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Greg Alexander. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that Cuba is a really great nation. One of the most impressive things about Cuba is that they outlawed homelessness by housing every citizen. The people have, of Cuba have accomplished many great things. They deserve a better relationship with their northern neighbor. But this resolution won't have any effect. This council doesn't control or even advise any part of the federal government. No one will heed this letter. So why bother? What jumps out to me is that council member Rollo and Sandberg sponsored this resolution. They have been stalwart voices against solving our own city's housing problems. They have both voted repeatedly to make it harder to build new housing, and they have both voted directly to criminalize homelessness. They believe in as many words that it should be lawful to arrest people and charge them with a crime just for being homeless. Thanks to their leadership, our city has actively rejected many chances to achieve the same justice that the people of Cuba currently enjoy. I believe these council members are using this resolution as a distraction from their substantive positions on local policy. It is an empty gesture made for appearances. I recommend you vote it down. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Additional comments either on Zoom or here in the chambers? Okay. Yes, comments on, the, on this item, please. If you would, share your name for the record, and then you'll have five minutes to comment on 2301. Daryl Rubel. 
I was sitting in my house about five minutes ago, and I watch you guys all the time. And I got the smoke coming out of my ears right now, okay? I'm pretty pissed. You drive down by Seminary Park, the woods are all around Bloomington, are full of homeless, and you're worried about Cuba. What about Bloomington, man? You've done destroyed Bloomington. The history that we had here is gone. If you watch Breaking Away, that's your Bloomington. It's gone. But you guys are worried about Cuba. Why? Why are you worried about Cuba? What about Bloomington? This is the problems here. You're always talking about Seattle. Seattle this, Seattle that. I wish I could really, really say what I was thinking about that. Bloomington is unique, man. Worry about Bloomington. Quit worrying about Cuba. I speak for probably thousands of other people in Bloomington tonight that got the smoke coming out of their ears too. What the, who the hell do you people think you are? You're not at the White House. Worry about Bloomington, man. Your egos are big, man. There's two people on, up there that I like. Is, it, is that guy, where's he at? Ron Smith and Mr. Jim Sims. The homeless is out of control in Bloomington. Listen, it's out of control. You go by Seminary Park, they're down there doping, drinking half gallons of vodka, and you're worried about Cuba. Why? Who do you think you are? This is Bloomington. This guy right here, I, I keep, I'm gonna bring this up every time I come up here. This guy here, Steve Bowen, when we talked about homeless a while back, I'm upset, yeah, everybody's looking, this guy's out of control. No, this guy right here wanted to put a homeless camp in Rose Hill. That was his, his uh, uh, you know. Mr. Rubel, just by way of reminder, this is for comments specifically on this piece of legislation. About Cuba? Right, on okay, Resolution 2301. About, and there's thousands of other people that like to be up here today why are you worried about them people, man? They're not, a, you know, we're being invaded at the border. The fentanyl, and the, you guys don't ever say the word fentanyl up there. It's out of control. Meth, it's, it's everywhere, man. You can't keep Bloomington police here because they don't want to mess with it. They go to arrest one of them. The mayor says, well, don't arrest them. They're homeless. Man, we got laws, man. Enforce those. That's why we were, uh, DCOP said the other day, he said 20 or 30 officers short. Well, hell, you can't keep police in this town. They don't want to work where their hands are tied. That's everywhere, man. Seattle, all them places, everybody's having that problem with the police. Their hands are tied, and you're losing the police. And also, Brad Rushton was up here a minute ago that works in fleet maintenance. I totally support him, man. Fleet maintenance at the city of Bloomington is way understaffed. And you guys are worried about Cuba. I know this may not, might, might not be the right time or something, whatever you think. Okay, but I was sitting at home and I, 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 I lived about five minutes away and that just got to me. Worry about Bloomington, fentanyl, meth. You guys know what that means? We're under attack. Our children are under attack. You guys do something about that. We got Biden in the White House, ain't doing nothing. I'll be so glad when he's gone. And another thing, one, one more thing I'm gonna say before I go. You know, the January 6th thing, this is all out of, I'm just going off the rail here. But you know what January 6th thing? They went after all them guys that done all that. You know who all was in on that? Antifa, they was all playing, that was all playing, man. To make it look like it was Trump's people. Again, Mr. Rivel, I'll remind you to confine your remarks, please, to this particular piece okay, of legislation. But, but anyway, this is called free speech. But anyway, they went after the January 6th people. Why don't they go after the people that burned all them buildings down and burned all them cop cars? That pissed me off. That made my blood boil when them terrorists, rioters in, in all them states was on top of them police cars mashing the roofs in. I was so mad. But why ain't we going after them people that are on video? There's plenty of video of them people. Why are we not going after them like we did the January 6th people? And I want to know too, Remember the, the pile of bricks? The pile of bricks that was left on the sidewalk? I, would, I want to know before I die who put them there. That's never been Mr. Rubel, you're at your time. Thank you for your okay. comments.
But do Mr. something Lucas, about the fentanyl and the heroin and the Thank you for your comments, Mr. Rubel. Your, okay. your time. Nobody Mr. likes Lucas, you people. Mr. Lucas, do we have any additional commenters on Zoom? And that thing at Rogers and Allen Mr. Street, Rubel, that monstrosity in the side on the, on the road, that needs to come out of there. Mr. That's Rubel, thank you for your comments. That's right across the street. And thank that thing up there on Third Street behind Jim Carrey, them chicanes, them chicanes need to go too, because Iris, uh, watch back. Mr. Rubel, thank you for your comments. Okay. Your comment and your time is concluded. Okay. You'll need to step away That's from the my microphone free now. Right there, okay? Mr. Lucas, are there any additional commenters on Zoom? Don't be talking about putting homeless shelters in, in no, not homeless camps in Rose Hill Cemetery no more either, okay? I'm very, I'm very upset by you saying that. Are there any additional comments here in chambers? Okay, with that, we'll come back to council for additional questions. Council Member Sandberg. No questions. But I did want to make a comment about what a shame that we start this meeting this evening with our council statement and the statement from the mayor of Bloomington against the racist attack that we just experienced in this community and a reminder of the resolutions that this council has passed in the past making statements that we well know are non-binding. We well know that we have no control over foreign policy. We have no control over what Congress does or what the President of the United States does. This is our statement that we bring forward on behalf of residents of this community who are caring about this issue. And this has been on the back burner for a long time because other city matters that this council deal with has taken priority. And so bringing a resolution like this forward uh, I highly resent any implication that this is done for any other reason than respect for people in this community that are standing up for other people. That's what we do here in Bloomington. That's what this, this meeting started with this evening. Our resolutions and our commitment to work on all kinds of social issues and problems mm -hmm. and policies that this council uh, is, is responsible for. So um, what a shame. That's all I can say, that what Thank started out as a good meeting is now turned into this. Thank you. Questions? Councilmember Volan. A uh, question I wanted to follow up on, Councilmember. Oh, she's got let's, a question. I'll let's follow focus up. on Thank questions, you. and then we'll come to comment. Councilmember, whose hand did I miss? Councilmember Piedmont-Smith. Well, um, my question about whether uh, a statement against the embargo uh, would encapsulate a statement against any and all sanctions was not answered. Uh, is there anybody who can answer that? Just to clarify, so sanctions against uh, aiding inter military? Is that what the, the question Yes, is? in the policy statement that was in our packet, it says yeah. there are specific sanctions against the Cuban military, and I don't want to say that those are bad. Um, well. I guess we could say that now. Uh, I, I'm not interested in that. I think that we, I mean, sadly, the U U.S. supports a lot of despotic re regimes around the world. Um, I, I don't regard Cuba as a threat, but, and I don't see it actively repressing people. Um, I'm more concerned with food, energy, medical supplies, and, and things of that sort. So that's the meaning of this resolution. If you have a friendly amendment, I'd be all ears. Uh, is there anybody who can answer the question? Mr. Marshall, could you step up to the microphone, please? Well, the Cuban military does uh, control a significant amount of the, the economy. Um, they um, frequently run uh, state-owned industries. Um, so I'm not sure why that is a concern of yours because the military certainly isn't um, involved with any direct repression of the Cuban people. You really don't see a whole lot of military members in general um, on the streets. Uh, basically that would be police that handle uh, civilian affairs. Um, so I, I'm not sure, may, may I ask what is the issue that you're concerned about specifically with the military? 
Well, I am uh, by no means uh, an expert. I can only go upon what was in our council <laughs> packet. Um, so uh, under selected U.S. sanctions, it says transactions with the Cuban military. In 2017, the State Department published a list of entities controlled by the Cuban military, intelligence, or security services with which direct financial transactions would disproportionately benefit those services or personnel at the expense of the Cuban people or private enterprise. This, quote, Cuba okay. restricted list includes 231 entities, uh, parentheses, ministries, hotels, businesses. Um, now, I do note 2017 is mm -hmm. under the Trump administration, so I take that um, with a grain of salt, anything that happened during that period. But um, yeah, that I, I also am aware that there, were, uh, there was repression following demonstrations in 2021. And uh, if it's anything like other, uh, in other nations, repression often comes through military. Um, okay. Services. Well, I don't know that the military was actively involved with repression of, of those demonstrations, and it's difficult to uh, gauge the degree of repression that was experienced because, I mean, even right here in the United States, um, a, a, a lot of demonstrators res are repressed on many occasions. Um, you know, so relatively speaking, you know, I was not there. Um, the the other what I what I can um, answer in part would be uh, the concern about the military running the state-owned industries, and that essentially would be a concern also among some of the Cuban people that there is a. Uh, a degree, um, some would say large, some maybe not so large, but a uh, degree of um, economic inequality between those who have power and, and your regular ordinary citizens. Um, so the concern with them, the military running businesses, uh, would be that they will benefit from higher salaries from sitting at the top of these businesses. Um, so in a country that is supposed to be relatively equal, you know, the Gini index, for example, of income inequality is fairly high, right? Almost on par with the average in Latin America from last I saw. So there is economic inequality and it's also been driven by the opening of the private sector and so some, uh, some entrepreneurs are becoming relatively wealthy on the Cuban level. Um, and that's also a concern uh, of the Cuban government it itself. Um, of course, they're a little more skeptical of the private sector since uh, this widespread private sector is something that's basically new since the revolution. There's always been some amount of private economic activity, but not so much as till now. So they were a little bit skeptical. Um, so the other aspect of inequality would be officials who sit on the top of hierarchies who obtain large salaries. And actually, the salaries are almost never that large, but they get sort of informal benefits under the table. Weekends uh, at, on, on a resort, for example, things like that that, other be that others don't. Mr. Marshall, I, I think you have um, given me sufficient context okay. yeah. for, right. the, for the question. Thank okay. you so much. Great. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Common sense. My gosh, we just got to hold on to it, don't we? I think this is the big issue, Isabel. The, we trade with everyone in this world, the Philippines, Belarus, Brazil, and we don't go to such a microscopic, I mean, I'm not gonna say everything in Cuba is great. It isn't, but the embargo is preventing it from getting better. And on such a um, personal, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, home, food, if this embargo, and we're not gonna lift, what the gentleman said who uh, spoke through Zoom, we're just going to be one of many saying, 
we agree that this country should be included in the world economy. That's really what this little statement is. And so many countries that are, I think, far worse are included in the world economy. That's what I think this is about. And also, I'm very sad with what just happened. This was a good moment, and it was kind of weaponized here against some people. I would love to see our elections this year not be this way, but be with people speaking about getting together and solving problems and not figuratively stabbing people with statements. I, I, I was very sad to hear that young man speak because I came here open-hearted after my experience in Cuba, wanting them to enter the world economy, not to have an opportunity to have it weaponized, and no joke, the main things we need to deal with are Bloomington issues. It's just, just by way a of reminder, we're responding to particular questions. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Let me come back. I'll just say what the last thing is. By by passing this, it'll be, you know, they one would be able to go to Congress and say, 300 cities are for letting them into the economy, and I think that's like a building block. So we'd be a building block. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Additional questions. Seeing none, are there comments from council? Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I, I am uh, all in favor of lifting the embargo. I think that the United States should uh, have normal diplomatic and economic relations with Cuba. Um, I am, uh, I'm concerned with details. I'm concerned with um, uh, knowing exactly what I'm voting on and um, knowing what it, what it means, uh, difference between sanctions and embargo. I mean, I did some Googling during the meeting. I have listened to the context, uh, if not a direct answer to my question, but the context given by uh, people who have been in Cuba. And I, I am satisfied that I can, uh, in good conscience, vote for this. Um, you know, before I read the details uh, this past week, I was certainly in favor of uh, making such a statement I think that um, uh, the, I agree with Ms. Lee uh, that um, it's, it's ridiculous to think that we're uh, going to create any positive change with an embargo uh, that has been ongoing for 60 years and has not changed uh, substantially the, the government in Cuba to become a democracy. So um, uh, I feel it's important to look at the language that we are actually approving and understand what we're approving, and that was the nature of my questions this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Councilmember Volan, then Councilmember Rollo. Yeah, I'm glad that Councilmember Sandberg uh, spoke up. I, I think that um, until our uh, friend who spoke earlier uh, got to Antifa, there was some, it's saying some really compelling things that uh, haven't seen since uh, David R. Grubb used to come and speak at that uh, podium. Uh, and mark my words, David R. Grubb was a compelling speaker, but um, he raised a question that despite the, uh, the bluster and the right-wing talking points uh, is a question that many people have asked here for a long time, which is why does a council like Bloomington pass resolutions for things beyond its its boundaries beyond its can. And until he spoke, and until Councilor Sandberg spoke in response, rightly condemning the tenor of his remarks, it had never really crystallized for me before. Um, and I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, how to think about such resolutions. It is a legitimate criticism. Why is the city of Bloomington thinking about things way beyond its pay grade merit jurisdiction? Um, well, it's because, and again, we didn't even do it for the first time until 2019 where we created a comprehensive plan. And we've been trying to, I mean, the comprehensive plan was the first one titled that. Before that, we had two growth policies plans that were more narrowly defined. They were just talking about how we built in the city. But a comprehensive plan talks about how we manage the city overall. And it largely, I mean, the UDO came out of it but the comprehensive plan isn't limited to determining what the UDO will be. Uh, the, the passage of a resolution is a passage of the sense of the council. And 
if there's one thing that maybe we could be criticized for, it's not doing enough to pay attention to the prior resolutions that we've passed uh, that are the sense of the council uh, because they are supposed to guide us in our future actions. And the comprehensive plan put together for the first time under that title all the different senses that we believe we should be considering when managing the city. This resolution takes its place among any previous resolution that we've passed uh, to that end. While they may seem disconnected, and in fact they have been disconnected for a long time, uh, future councils, uh, our future selves as long as this council exists, and future councils should be looking to prior resolutions uh, to determine what the next course of action is. And indeed, this is relevant to members of our community. And if it's relevant to members of our community, it's relevant to the community. Uh, there's any number of resolutions that uh, haven't been brought forward. Uh, we, there, there are significant members of the community who have a relationship with Cuba. Um, and some of the lessons that we may learn in this resolution uh, will apply uh, to other issues. We'll be surprised to find what they are. What we, what we must do, what this resolution tells me we must do in the future, uh, starting now, is uh, be better about remembering our prior resolutions, as well as this one, and following up with their promise. It's something that we just have not committed enough to. Uh, this is why the, th this is how, I mean, I, ironically, the sponsor of this resolution are perhaps the most uh, uh, strong advocates for the, the police department uh, in the city. And uh, the uh, ludicrousness of the, their, the critique against them tonight uh, just you know, showed that uh, uh, we've been unfocused. We've allowed the debate to get unfocused. Um, so we need to let this resolution also represent our need to focus better on this and prior resolutions uh, to blend them into sort of a, the, to the, the comprehensive plan when we next review it. Um, to take the prior ones that didn't get included into the comprehensive plan and include it into the plan, that's what we should be doing with those resolutions is making sure that we follow up on their promise and their legacy. So uh, I am happy to support this, even though in the past I've had qualms about supporting resolutions for exactly the same reason that our friend uh, had too. Like, shouldn't we be paying attention to Bloomington? I would submit that this is paying attention to Bloomington. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rollo. Thanks. Um, well, the, if you look at our record, the vast majority of our work on the council is about Bloomington. Um, uh, but we do reserve time for uh, citizens to come forward and advocate for uh, matters like this. And I appreciate that a great deal. Um, we've long been a forum for 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 this advocacy, and it's and it's focused on state and national and even international matters. In fact, my first council meeting was a, a resolution to oppose the Iraq War, and this gallery was filled, and it was quite an experience for my first meeting on the council in 20, 2003. Um, and we were right at that time, actually, uh, I have to say. Um, we have established diplomatic relationships with Cuba, with Santa Clara. Delegations have visited. Uh, this uh, Cuba Amistad is a group that is focused on that, is concerned about it, and makes frequent visits. Um, these matters affect us, uh, even at an international level. And, and it's important that we bring these matters to the attention of uh, elected officials, sort of up the food chain. I just want to say that personally, one of my formative moments was uh, during the nuclear freeze movement in the early 1980s when, when I was in college. And um, we were very close, it seemed, to going to nuclear war, really on the brink. And uh, the, the world community really took, took charge and began demonstrating. And there were resolutions like, like we have passed tonight uh, happening at city levels, at town levels, town forums, and so forth. That had an effect. It actually moved the needle. It, it forced leaders at higher levels to back away and actually initiate things like the INF Treaty, Open Skies, and so forth, which have now been reversed, unfortunately. But 
Um, so it is effective. It's not, it's, it, we're not impotent, we're not uh, ineffectual. So I appreciate uh, council uh, debating this topic and I uh, appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Council Member Sandberg. Well, just to say thank you to the individuals from Kubamastad who brought this to our attention. We are very sorry that it's taken us this long to bring it forward um, because we did have other matters to deal with in the city of Bloomington and we can do many things all at the same time. We have sister cities, we have sibling sisters, cities with the city of Palo Alto, and why do we do that? Because Bloomington is not an island, we are not an isolated community. We do want to partner with, um, with cities abroad as well as cities here in the United States uh, as we all face the serious problems that all cities across the country and all nations in this world deal with, with poverty and homelessness and illness and um, uh, all kinds of things that we don't have the solutions for all of them, but to the extent that we do have residents in this city who care about these things and who care enough to bring them forward to their council representatives for representation is a good thing. And I apologize gravely for any unpleasantness tonight and any weaponizing that was made out of this issue, which was very, in my mind, straightforward and productive and a positive thing. So thank you for bringing it to us. Thank you. Additional comments? I'll just wrap up by adding my thanks as well, particularly to residents, certainly to the sponsors, but particularly to the residents um, who have brought this in, who has clearly done research and been on the ground um, and have reminded us that we are not becoming less interdependent in this world. Uh, and I thank you for that reminder. I've spent my entire adult life working for colleges and universities. Uh, and I find particularly compelling the chilling effect of sanctions and embargoes on scholarly pursuits and discovery uh, that's all, that have the potential to develop solutions for a lot of our problems. So thank you very much for that, and I'm pleased to support this. So seeing no further comments, will the clerk please call the roll on Resolution 2301? Yes, Councilmember Rosenberger? Yes. I'm sorry, was that a yes? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Grallo? Yes. Smith? Yes. Volan? Yes. And Flaherty? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. That passes 8 0. Madam President, I move that resolution 2302 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor of the motion to introduce by title and synopsis, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Madam Clerk, if you would please. Resolution 2302. Resolution of the Common Council of the City of Bloomington adopting Indiana Code Section 523 for use as an alternative alternative procurement method. The synopsis is as follows. This resolution adopts the provisions of Indiana Code Title V, Article 23 with all of its chapters, parts, and subparts for the purpose of giving the city the authority to enter into and utilize public-private agreements according to the procedures and requirements applicable to such agreements as provided in that statute. Thank you. Uh, Resolution 2302 be adopted. Second. Thank you. And with that, I believe we have members of administration to speak with us this evening. And I can't even tell who that is exactly. <laughs> uh, good, good evening, Council. This is uh, Attorney Chris Wheeler for the City of Bloomington. Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. Uh, to discuss this resolution. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Closed captioning was covering up most of your image, and so I couldn't quite tell who it was. <laughs> so, well, uh, nice to make your acquaintance. Thank you. So, uh, this resolution, as the synopsis mentioned, is to adopt a specific uh, section of the Indiana Code. It's 5 23. 
And uh, that state statute is a, um, a discussion about public private agreements. Uh, back, back in 1997, uh, this common council adopted um, the state level version of this statute. It was Indiana code 36-1-14.3. Uh, that was a local government version of the state government's public private agreement statute. And uh, unfortunately, not more than a year later in 1998, the Indiana state legislature repealed that statute. So for a very brief moment in history, the city of Bloomington had the ability to enter into uh, public private agreements. Uh, but once that, uh, once Indiana state legislature repealed that statute, we no longer had the ability to enter into these types of agreements. Uh, in order to enter into these types of agreements, we have to adopt Indiana Code 5-23. And that is what I am here asking council to do this evening on behalf of the controller's office and also on behalf of uh, the utilities department, but also on behalf of all of the departments that might like to make use of this opportunity. Um, I could go through and read uh, what the statute uh, entails um, if the council wishes, or I could just uh, happily take answers from council as to what the statute uh, requires of us uh, to enter into these types of agreements. Yeah, I, I'm at your leisure and pleasure. Council members, do we wish to go to questions? Do we wish to have Mr. Wheeler expand on his presentation? Let's go to questions. I think that may inform some of what goes on. So. Questions from council? Council member Piedmont Smith? Yeah, I guess I'm uh, uh, surprised that um, it took this long for the city to uh, kind of realize that there was a problem and to uh, adopt this. Um, by reference, the, the new Indiana, well, the Indiana code that was passed in 1998, which is not new at all. Uh, so is there a, a certain um, public-private agreement uh, coming down the pike that uh, initiated this review and found this problem? There actually, yes, the utilities department uh, in discussion with the controller's office was looking at um, other ways that it might um, undertake various public work projects for that department, one of which was to do some substantial rewiring, electrical rewiring of one of its um, uh, one of its uh, uh, facilities, and I can't remember which one it was, um, and they're still looking at doing that, um, and they would be using an operating agreement as part of um, its effort to get the rewiring done. There are two types of public-private agreements that this statute allows uh, cities to enter into. One is called a build-operate transfer agreement, and the other one is an operating agreement uh, utilities wanted to enter into a, a public-private agreement through operating agreement to get this work done, and they were uh, asking me to do that for them when I realized we can't do that. We simply don't have the opportunity to do so because we don't have uh, this statute adopted by city council. And so that's what prompted um, us to bring uh, this request to city council by way of resolution. An operating agreement um, would allow the city to negotiate the method by which um, costs would be shared between um, the contractor uh, and the city. And that is what uh, the utilities department was interested in doing. Thanks. Thank you. Additional questions? If not, I have one. Okay. Um, Mr. Wheeler, thank you for you actually answered a couple of my questions already. Um, in our materials, we have board is defined as the agent, board, commission, officer, or trustee of a public agency having the power to award contracts on behalf of the public agency. So if, if I'm reading that correctly, that will include the proposed, or well, the, the launched 501c3 City of Bloomington capital improvements. Is that correct? It depends on what that project is, is trying to do and how they're doing it. If they're not entering into what would be considered a public-private agreement, then no, it wouldn't uh, fall under this rubric. 
Um, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that project. I, if I knew more information about it, I could certainly help uh, analyze and answer that for you. Um, perhaps Ms. Carmichael can comment. Um, no, no. I, I guess, or, or Ms. Kate, I'm just curious about the relationship between Resolution 2302 and the new 501c3. Beth Kate, Corporation Council. Honestly, I have not looked at that issue, uh, but I'll be happy to, uh, as well as Mr. Wheeler, and get back to you on it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional questions? Okay. Seeing none, let's go to public comment. Is there anyone in chambers who would like to offer comment on Resolution 2302? And Mr. Lucas, while we're waiting on that, if you would make the announcement on Zoom, please. Yes, if any members of the public on Zoom would like to comment on this resolution, please use the raise hand feature to let us know. You can find that raise hand button in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. Thank you. I'm not seeing any raised hands in chambers or anyone approaching the podium. Mr. Lucas? Not on Zoom. Okay. Seeing no requests for comment, let's come back to council for any additional questions. And any final comments? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll on Resolution 2302. Council Member Sandberg? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Smith? Yes. Volin? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. And Rosenberger. Yes. Thank you. And that passes 8-0-0. Thank you. Madam President. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Madam President, I move that resolution appropriation ordinance 2206 uh, be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> Thank you. Will the clerk please read? Appropriation Ordinance 2206, an ordinance appropriating the proceeds of the City of Bloomington, Indiana General Revenue Annual Appropriation Bonds of 2022, together with all investments earnings thereon, for the purpose of providing funds to be applied to the cost of certain capital improvements for public safety facilities and paying miscellaneous costs in connection with the foregoing and the issuance of said bombs and sale thereof and approving an agreement of the Bloomington Redevelopment Commission to purchase certain property. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance makes an additional appropriation to be provided for out of the proceeds of the City of Bloomington, Indiana General Revenue Annual Appropriation Bonds of 2022, authorized by Ordinance 2230, together with any interest earnings thereon, which will be applied to finance costs of constructing, renovating, replacing, repairing, improving, and or equipping certain facilities for the City's Police and Fire Department, together with the costs of issuance thereof. It also approves of a purchase agreement between the City of Bloomington's Redevelopment Commission, the City of Bloomington, and CFC LLC for the purchase of a portion of the Showers Building Complex for $8.75 million. Thank you. Appropriation Ordinance 2206 be adopted. Second. Thank you. I believe we have members of the administration who would like to offer comments. I believe we also have a council committee that has a report this evening. Uh, why don't we go first with administration and then council committee? Okay, please go ahead. Good evening, Mary Catherine Carmichael, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Cleansing breath after the rest of the earlier part of our evening. Let's start afresh. Here we go. I want to begin my comments the way I ended them at the last meeting of the ad hoc committee meeting on this topic. And that's just to say I'm concerned about how this discussion about a pretty simple question, whether or not to buy the additional showers property and unite public safety in the most and <clears throat> most of the other city departments under one roof has kind of devolved into an us versus them approach to the issue. We are us and we are them, all city employees with the exact same mission to serve our residents. Our specific jobs differ but the overarching goal is shared by every employee in every department. 
and many units besides police and fire are directly involved with public safety, uh, with protecting and preserving public safety. Community and Family Resources Department, Public Works, Utilities, Information Technology Services, for example. I hope that with this purchase, we'll realize our hope to better integrate public safety services and yes, achieve a better sense of shared community within our own organization. So the idea is to open up and connect the spaces that are, are the current city hall that we're in at this moment and the CFC portion of showers. It is our hope that there would be plenty of opportunities throughout any given day to work together. The purchase is focused on just what we pledged earlier, providing enhanced facilities for public safety activities now and room for expanded police and fire operations in the future so that we aren't back at this drawing board in a few years. Please, as you continue to debate this purchase tonight, keep in mind that the genesis of, this, of the idea to purchase this space was to improve the working conditions of our public safety personnel and better integrate them into the vital work they do and do exceptionally well into the city of Bloomington community. Usually an upgrade in working conditions is viewed as a really positive thing, and I'm, so I'm not really sure where this discussion got a little off track, but let me state without, <clears throat> excuse me, let me state categorically that from the administration's perspective, this purchase is to enhance, enable, and elevate the work of our public safety personnel. I ask that you once again consider this issue tonight, that you, that as you once again consider this issue tonight, that you keep in mind the following. This is likely a once in a ge generation opportunity to unite us under one sawtooth roof. The CFC space has been meticulously maintained, is extremely well engineered, and is flexible in its possible op applications for our use. Proceeds from the sale of the existing police building property would be used to offset the purchase price of the new space. And to portray the administration as doing this to the Bloomington Police Department is not accurate. To the contrary, the idea is to purchase this building for the Bloomington Police Department and the Bloomington Fire Department administration. The salient points remain unchanged. This space prepares us for the future growth that is bound to happen in Bloomington one way or another. This space will provide far superior working conditions that should aid employee retention and expansion, which has never been more important than it is today. This superior space will provide adequate and appropriate room for each employee to perform their duties, to store evidence properly, and to provide room for meetings and equipment. This space is ADA compliant and accessible and includes an elevator. Police departments operate successfully in urban environments across the country and the world. If you tour each facility, the superiority of the shower space is self-evident. An investment in this space makes far more sense than continuing to put money in an undersized, outdated building with serious deficiencies, not the least of which is an unresolved and ongoing threat of flooding. This building is in a great location and is a fantastic use of a historic building cherished by and known to this community. And finally, any space, new or existing, will have pros and cons. We have the wherewithal to work through any issues that present themselves with the space and the location this purchase affords us. We're here to urge you to look into the long-term future of this community, these departments, and the evolving work of our public safety personnel and to vote to complete the purchase of this much-needed space. We have staff on hand and our consultant J uh, from JS Held, Deb Koontz, whom many of you know, Bond Council and others are here present tonight to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Boland, you have yeah. a report for us. Yes, I do. Um, it'll take about 10 minutes. Uh, Mr. Lucas, I'll ask you to put it up in about five minutes. I'll call for the, sp the spreadsheet. I'm going to just read the report uh, of the Ad Hoc Committee on Public Safety Headquarters. Um, and uh, you know, I'll be happy to answer questions about it afterwards. Uh, the committee consisted of council members Piedmont Smith, Rollo, Sandberg, and myself. We met in the Allison Room in City Hall three times on January 3rd, 10th, and 13th. 
Our objective was to more fully understand the options evaluated by Mayor Hamilton's administration in proposing that council approve the purchase of the commercial west third of the Showers Brothers Furniture Factory where City Hall has occupied the east third since 1996, here and after referred to as Showers Plaza. The committee first met to formulate questions to be answered by experts or those with detailed knowledge of the problem. The police department resides in 20,000 square feet of space on East 3rd Street. Uh, it, uh, it needs at least 50% more space. The fire department administration is in temporary quarters and needs at least 5,000 square feet of space. The mayor's administration investigated three different scenarios for an expansion of square footage for public safety operations. A, to purchase Showers Plaza for $8.75 million from CFC Inc. and to renovate approximately 35,000 of its approximately 64,000 square feet for use as a public safety headquarters at a cost of $14.75 million for a total of $23.5 million. B, to expand in place at the current headquarters of the police department and build a multi-story addition on the parking lot adjacent to its west for a total cost of $25.3 million or C, to build an all new 35,000 square foot headquarters at an undetermined new site for a total cost of 31.5 million. These options the committee have been referring to as plans A, B, and C respectively. I presented an annotated summary spreadsheet of the costs of each plan. The committee asked questions about how each of, uh, of about 18 different line items in the spreadsheet were determined for each plan, which we'll see in a moment, and asked that the figures be justified at a meeting to follow. At this, second, at this first meeting, the committee heard from several members of the administration, including uh, new Deputy Mayor Mary Catherine Carmichael, who's present, new Director of Public Engagement Kaiser Goodman, who's present, and Assistant City Larry Allen, who's also present tonight. The administration received our questions, but stated its position that if Plan A is not approved by Council with passage of the appropriation ordinance on the table, it does not intend to pursue the Plan B studied by Ms. Kuntz. At the second meeting, representatives of the Fraternal Order of Police, Detective Jeff Rogers and Officers Paul Post, Kylie Jarrett, and John Hoffmeister were invited to present their knowledge of the existing police headquarters. Their belief is that Plan B is overestimated and that the current building needs very little renovation if it is paired with new construction. I took the liberty of preparing a rough floor plan of the building on which they demonstrated the department's internal discussion about how to reuse that space in the case of an expansion. The evidence division could expand to half the lower level by walling off two hallways and still be secure. Patrol could expand to half the upper level and have enough space for desks for each of its sergeants with construction of a bathroom and two security doors on the upper level. And a drain around the perimeter of the building would put an end to the building's flooding issues. The renovations would cost perhaps a ninth of the $5 million the architect estimated would be necessary to renovate the existing building. These estimates and comments were not accompanied with any architectural, engineering, or professional builder's review or estimates subject to review and questioning. At the third meeting, in addition to the above, although Officer Jarrett was not in attendance, architect Deb Koontz of the firm JS Held, Fire Chief Jason Moore, both of whom are present tonight, and Police Chief Mike Dekoff is present tonight, were in attendance. We went through the spreadsheet and Ms. Koontz responded to the many questions posed in it and by committee members. She acknowledged that there were some potential oversights in some of her estimates, such as perhaps the need for an elevator for the existing building in Plan B, or that its equipment costs were nominally inflated, but otherwise stood by her estimates. She explained that a couple of lines were key to understanding the overall cost of construction, the owner's representative and construction contingency fee lines. These are calculated as a portion of the combined cost of construction and equipment uh, respectively 17 and 10% for each of those fees. FOP reps were asked for their response. They reiterated that the current building was recently renovated, including all new flooring and locker rooms, and that the building was purpose built as a police station 60 years ago, while Showers was not and is twice as old. Chiefs Moore and Dekoff weighed in with their perspectives. Chief Moore noted that the fire department's need for a new headquarters was urgent, argued for the benefits of co-location, and for its proximity not only to other public safety functions, but to City Hall itself. Chief Dekoff noted that the presence of social workers in the department were having a decisive impact in reducing call volumes that needed to be addressed by sworn officers, and that co-locating in showers was likely to enhance its benefit. Can we have the spreadsheet up on the screen now? The primary figures, if you can enlarge just a little bit, yeah, that'd be great. 
The primary figures in dispute all sur uh, center around plans, Plan B's costs of new construction and renovation. Ms. Kuntz's estimate of $9.5 million for new construction at BPD headquarters is for a four-story building that includes a $2 million first floor parking deck. She noted that this was not an estimate for underground parking beneath a three-story building, but the first floor of a four-story building. The FOP has argued that the deck is extraordinarily expensive and unnecessary, as surface parking and strategic use of off-site parking are available to them. In addition, Ms. Kuntz's estimate of $500 per square foot for new construction was questioned. She argued that recent headquarters projects in other cities highlighted by the FOP were approved and built before the recent spike in inflation, and that by the time the project is let in another year, her estimates will be reasonable. Her estimate of $250 per square foot for, quote, heavy, unquote, renovation of the entirety of the existing headquarters building assumed detailed design work that was premature at this point, but that it was reasonable to assume that redesigning the headquarters as a whole would necessitate significant demolition and renovation. The fees for owner's representative and construction contingency represent a significant portion of the total cost. If you could scroll up just a little bit to show lines F2 and F5. Uh, yeah, there you go on the screen. They're highlighted in pink here. Um, they represent uh, a significant portion of the total cost and would change significantly in a plan B that the FOP envisions. If renovation costs were reduced from $5 million to the $600,000 they estimated and the $300,000 for adding an elevator to the existing building was eliminated, uh, the combined cost of construction and equipment for plan B would drop from $18.8 million to $12.0 million, reducing the combined fees cost, which represent a total of 27% of the construction and equipment costs from 5.1 to 3.25 million. Overall, under this scenario, the total cost of Plan B would drop from 25.3 million to 16.4 million, a difference of almost $9 million, and 7 million less expensive than the acquisition and renovation of Showers Plaza. Again, this estimate has not been provided by an architectural firm, but is based on FOP personal estimates. The administration does not agree with either the estimates or the propriety of minimal renovation of existing space. Another committee concern was the likelihood of and the timetable for the whole of Showers Plaza being used for public safety. You can scroll to the, there you go. Uh, only a little more than half the building would be renovated. The rest would be banked. The rough acquisition cost of the 47% or so of the building that would be banked would be 4.1 million, not including bond interest. The banked office space might also be used for non-public safety purposes by the city when the dollars earmarked for it came from the portion of the new ED lit tax specifically intended for public safety. The administration argued that the benefits of securing office space adjacent to City Hall outweigh these concerns and that if the city wins its annexation case in the courts, that extra space would be required sooner than later. The committee did not form with the intent of making a recommendation to council, so none is provided herein. The committee's primary observations were that, number one, Ms. Kuntz's assumption that all 20,000 square feet of the existing police headquarters would need to be uh, renovated, let alone at the heavy estimated costs of $250 a square foot, is unwarranted. Uh, B, the new construction cost estimate of $500 a square foot should be seen as the upper limit of a range that the eventual cost would fall into, not necessarily the guaranteed cost of new construction in plans B or C. Uh, number C, the low end estimate for the cost of a plan B with the FOP's quote, ultra light unquote renovation of the existing building and three stories of new construction on its adjacent parking lot, $16.4 million would be significantly less than the quote unquote high end estimated cost of acquiring Showers Plaza and renovating 35,000 square feet immediately, $23.5 million, enough so that a plan B merits serious consideration. And finally, the acquisition cost of, off of office space that would be banked indefinitely in plan A is 4.1 million or more than 17% of the plan A estimate. The committee recognizes the benefits of co-location at Showers Plaza and the value of its acquisition by the city, but questions the use of tax dollars earmarked for public safety for it. That concludes the report. I'm happy to address any questions or to invite other members of the committee to uh, amend or uh, uh, augment the report if they see, so, see fit. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Volan. Other members of the committee, which I believe was Council Member Rollo, Piedmont Smith and Sandberg. Any additions?
Seeing none, let's go to work on council questions. So. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Alla. Thank you for that excellent summation. Um, so my, my personal estimation of the ex expenses that have been given uh, for the renovation and construction is that they've been um, estimated higher than is probably necessary. So I'm in, a, in agreement with that. Um, but I want to focus on something that I found just recently, and that was within the uh, re reference in the Spring Point fe feasibility study. Um, and that study teamed up with a consultant, uh, Kessel Boos from uh, Massachusetts, who have expertise in um, redevelopment of uh, historic buildings for public safety. They're experts. And um, they, we have gotten a spreadsheet of their estimation of the cost of showers renovation. Um, Mr. Lucas, could you present that to the screen to, to remind people what that is? And I, I was mistaken because when I looked at it initially, I assumed that the, the, the total amount for the re renovation um, that was given was give or take maybe five or 10 percent, maybe five percent of what the um, Deb Kunz uh, presented in terms of total cost, about $24 million, I believe. If you go to the bottom, you'll see the, the, the total amount, 24.2. Um, but w what I failed to understand, and, and by asking some of the architects at Spring Point, I found that that estimate does not, did not include the, um, the land acquisition or, or the purchase of, of, of the backside of the building. So this is what this consultant was recommending just for renovation outside of any purchase. So if we had included purchase uh, costs, it would be $32 million. So um, by way of Mr. Lucas, I issued a question to Ms. Kunz, and I'd like to explore this a little bit further um, because you then, when you came on the scene, you were using numbers from uh, that they had produced, and somehow those numbers had been reduced um, by about one third. I un I understand. Um, some of those reductions seem uh, worry me. For instance, the removal, as you said, an e email of ballistic glass. Um, so, I guess what I'm interpreting here, and maybe I should leave this for comment, but is the, I think it's useful it's useful for the question, is that we're seeing a higher estimate of cost for staying put in renovation, okay, at the high end, and here we're seeing a very low end or negotiation down in terms of cost um, for the showers renovation and purchase. And I wondered if you could comment on, on what exactly did you decide that, that wasn't needed that was recommended by this by this consultancy firm. Sorry, just and maybe why, why that is the case. Sorry, I was doing some calculations as we walked up here. Uh, so I would be happy to address that, and as I did in writing, um, I, I want to be clear, the oh, Deb Kuntz, yes, Deb Kuntz, JS Held. Thank you. So the last estimate that was put on here, that is exactly the very first estimate that was received from Castle Booth. Um, and the question then that came to me was, how could it possibly cost $685 a square foot to renovate space for essentially an office function with evidence storage? So that, that was the first question that was asked of me. And so I did what any typical professional would do is I read the report. And because of my experience in working on other public safety and police stations, I started asking questions like the ballistic glass on the outside of the building. We're doing a new 90,000 square foot public safety full police station with dispatch 
in Lafayette, Indiana, brand new building, and there is, not, there is no ballistic glass on the outside of that building. Do police stations do that? Yes. Do they do it everywhere? No. So those are the, that's an example, one example, and there are other examples. Maybe we need to probe a little bit deeper here. The, what I was told is that this firm explores best practices. So would, you're saying that um, although ballistic glass on the outside of the building, mm -hmm. just in the HT today, the, the, uh, the police union were police members were saying that they feel exposed having so much glass. Um, so this firm said, well, ballistic glass is the best practice, but you said it's not necessary. So this was not Deb Kuntz saying it wasn't necessary. This was me in association with the chief, obviously. I do not make those choices for you. And really, when you step back at all of this, this is really about choices of scope. I mean, all of those uh, differences, you have many estimates now that you're looking at. And every one of those estimates has a different level of scope. And so those all are choices about what scope that you're going to take on. Now, I, will, I think it's also important to note for the record that I didn't take Castle uh, Booz's estimate and then just redo it. I did it in concert with them. We had meetings with them, with the chief was involved as well, and together, right, we said, okay, what does this mean if we do this? If, what if we do that? And, we ha and, and I can assure you that in concert with them, this is where we got to. I would have never presented a cost estimate that I did not believe that Castle Booz was gonna stand behind. Are you, so the patrol officers worry about the exposure of having so much glass, and we're saying, okay, it's not necessary to have ballistic glass. Where they're located now, they're in a, fair, they're in a protected building with very little windows. Is that a concern that we should be, I mean, they're concerned. The police officers are concerned. Are you concerned? So I think, I think the question here is about what is the scope that is going to be taken on and how are those decisions made, I think, is more of the question that you're asking. Ultimately, my job is to present all of the options, to present what I think the impacts of those are, but ultimately it's not my decision to determine whether ballistic glass is going to go on the outside of the building. If the choice was we need to do ballistic glass, then we would have included that in our estimate. So that was the decision of the group as to, to not include. And again, we're using one example here. We could debate every single scope item and be here a long time. So, but I think the, quest, the bigger question here is anytime a, a professional architect does an estimate, it is based on the scope of the project. So every different estimate you have is because every scope is a little bit different. Okay, okay. good for now. Thank you. Good for now, thank you. Additional round one questions. Seeing none, round, count, Council Member Smith. I didn't have a question for Ms. Kuntz, but I, I did have a question about the report. Is that appropriate? That's appropriate, go ahead. Um, I wanna thank everybody for that report and that, that work is really fantastic. Um, the one question I asked, um, and I don't, think I, I don't think I understood it to be answered, but maybe it was, if the city acquires the showers building and then has tenants, what happens to the revenue from the tenants? I, I, does it go back to reduce the bond? What happens to that? That's a very good question. Uh, that, of course, I'm not going to be the final answer on. Uh, the administration will need to answer it, and they may have an answer now. But I would start by saying that um, I share your interest in uh, a, a ballpark figure as to how much rent there might be and how much it might be able to defray the cost of acquiring the building. Um, I know that the leases, from what I've, uh, from discussions with the administration, I know that um, uh, the leases expire at varying times. Some last more than others. Um, I suppose they've been a little uncomfortable to talk about the exact, uh, you know, lease amounts. So um, there's got to be a sensitive way that we can get a sense of how much there might be there. Um, but I, ultimately, I think it, uh, it's, it's a question that I would like the administration to answer is can we get a, a ballpark figure of how much the cost of the building will be reduced uh, because a significant portion of it is still under lease and how much, you know, how much we can expect over, say, 
the life of the bond that that will cost. Uh, if uh, Deputy Mayor Carmichael has ability to answer that now, uh, that'd be great. But otherwise, uh, you know, I, I'd be happy to see something by next week. I, I think it could be procured by them, but it's, uh, I, would, I would ask her. Um, Deputy Mayor Mary Catherine Carmichael, um, good question. And I do know um, what the current amount of revenue received from rents is, and it's in the ballpark of $37,000 a month if that's helpful. Um, of course, uh, part of the answer to your question is gonna depend on how many people remain, how much of the building um, you know, we would be utilizing for public safety purposes, um, but does that be? Just to clarify, if I may, is the intent for that to reduce the bond or does that go back maybe to the general fund or something? So that would go toward the support of the building so, you know, expenses that are incurred as a result of having that building. To defray, so the, it would go to defray back, the bond? It, it would be money generated, you know, from the, the um, public safety space, but it would go back into the public safety space. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay. Council Member Volan? Uh, as a follow-up question to that, um, uh, do you think that the administration's new 501c3 would be the responsible party for that space while it's still under lease? Will you have it run by that? You know, I haven't, we, I haven't heard a discussion about that. I would, yeah, I don't know. We, I, I don't really know that we've discussed that, Steve, or I mean, Council Member Bowen, <laughs> thank Bowen, you. sorry. But I mean, it, it, it is reasonable for me to assume that that would be a logical way to manage it, would you say? Um, you know, uh, that's not how we manage our current space, so I don't know that it is fair to assume that we would... Uh, Wait, do, do we have other spaces where we lease out to third parties? Mm. I mean, it's one thing to, like, I mean, the Waldron I mean, I, is... I need an assist. Can I call an assist? Can yeah, I phone yeah, a yeah, friend? Yeah, please. Larry. Thank you. Uh, Larry Allen, Assistant City Attorney. Yeah, we, we have some spaces that we lease out to third parties. How we handle those right now, I, they're managed through, typically, uh, I think all of those, I'm not, I'm trying to think just to make sure I'm being completely accurate with you. Sure, so, sure. Um, please know that this is off the top of my head. So many of those are owned by the Redevelopment Commission, and so, oh, so they're, they're managed through that, through that ownership. And we do it kind of um, just individually to the property. So whether we're talking about the, the examples I have are College Square, uh, 627 South Morton are our properties and currently some of the spaces and garages uh, are leased properties that are kind of managed by the uh, Redevelopment Commission. Um, did you say, um, not 620, um, oh, is the Redevelopment Commission going to be the actual buyer of the building or will the city itself be the buyer? So the way this is set up right now is the Redevelopment Commission would be the, the, the buyer and the use, uh, the the proceeds that would be used to, to purchase this would be the bond if, if we were to go forward with this public safety. Uh, that doesn't mean that the Redevelopment Commission necessarily has to remain the owner. I mean, it could transfer to the city generally, um, depending on the, the discussion of that. Just generally, I can tell you about the Redevelopment Commission, how we own properties and what we do with the revenue, if that's helpful. Uh, the revenue that we use to purchase those properties, as, as Deputy Mayor Carmichael said, goes back into the property. So they come into a fund uh, which is an administrative fund of the Redevelopment Commission. We use from that fund to pay uh, all of the utilities, to pay repairs, because as you may know, uh, tax increment finance funds cannot be used for direct repairs of buildings, and so that kind of revenue has to be used for the building itself. And so I think that's, that's kind of where that answer is coming from in terms of what we would do with those rents is that first it's gonna maintain all of the utilities, all of the necessary repairs and things like that. There, there may be additional revenues. It's a little hard to, we can tell you what the leases are gonna be in the expiration dates and kind of give you a rough estimate. But I, I will just say it's gonna be a moving target just to be fair because it's gonna be a moving target because of the space that we're gonna to renovate to make sure that we're being strategic about who's in that spaces and whether we're relocating tenants from those spaces. So maybe they have a lease that goes five years, but they're in a key critical place that the police would need them to be relocated. So that's something that we've tried to look at. Well, that leads to another question. If sure. you know that you need 35,000 square feet collectively for police and fire headquarters, um, 
And I, my, my next question was going to be, won't there be a one-hour firewall built between the, head, the new headquarters and the remainder of the space? Like, how will it be secured? Uh, but I mean, if, if, if you're separating the spaces, what need is there to relocate people until we need to expand? Uh, I mean, the FOP has said that uh, for now, because there are so relatively few officers, I mean, the space that they have now can accommodate the full staff that uh, we have budgeted. Um, and uh, historically, even in uh, 10 years ago, uh, we weren't able to uh, hire more than net two new officers a year. I don't see that, uh, you know, that a need for more space coming particularly quickly. So if I, if I may, there's a yeah. couple of responses to that. First of all, in terms of the square footage estimates, there, there is probably a little bit of a uh, clarification we should make on the current square footage estimates. Currently, what, what I believe you estimated in your summary report was about 40% or a little over 40% right. would remain. However, that, that it seems to include common spaces as well, so hallways and things that aren't leased. So those aren't available office spaces. I think the, uh, and Deb Koontz can keep me honest here and give a more accurate uh, count for that, but that percentage of overall square foot footage that's actually available after the renovations would be done is much lower. I think it's, it's lower than even 30%. Um, it, likely in 28% range, I want to say, but again, Deb Coots can, can give better clarification. So that's kind of one point, just to, to be clear. The other point is, uh, CFC, and, and I don't mean to be too cute about this, but just to be practical, CFC, when leasing the building, isn't concerned where, where we wanted to put our public safety uh, location. So the leases are scattered throughout the building. And uh. so there's a matter of making sure that we do create a space of that can be secured, but also to avoid some of the additional cost of phasing. Again, this is where Deb is the expert here. But as we talked about with the current police station and that option, one of the additional costs there is because we have to phase construction because people will still need to use that space. We can't pull the police out of their current headquarters while we gut it and like completely renovate it, right? And so to avoid some of those costs, we'll want to make sure that we clear a part of the CFC building that, to make it ready for construction so we're not trying to phase it too much and incur additional expenses by dragging out the renovation too long. So that's, those are the kind of moving parts of those leases. That's why I say it's a little bit hard to determine. Thank you. I've got more questions, but I'll wait for other members. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Council Member Sandberg. I have questions that I hope the administration can answer about future expansion plans, period, over the whole portfolio of the city, because something that I he think I heard and I was learning for the first time is that is it true that utilities is going to be moving to a new building and that possibly public works is going to be moving to where utilities is? So I think the bigger overarching question here is what are the city's need for expansion, not just for police and fire, but for the whole city's portfolio in terms of people running out of space where we are here in showers and needing to purchase additional spaces, not here under the same roof where we can all, you know, chat together at the water cooler, but other city departments are now moving away from showers proper. Any, any uh, summary you can give us as to what the space needs for the city in general, not just for this public safety purpose? Uh, Mary Catherine Carmichael, Deputy Mayor. Um, so the plan right now, although I don't think everything's been approved, but the thought and the hope is that um, the City of Bloomington Utilities, which is bursting at the seams with equipment, and, and bear in mind the two departments I'm going to talk about right now are very equipment heavy uh, departments that not only have equipment, but they have, you know, giant pipes and uh, vehicles, so they, they require more space than, say, a planning department that really is mostly desks and, and computers and, and room for folks to work. So the thought is, uh, at this time, that City of Bloomington Utilities will move down to the Winston Thomas site, which um, is now clean and ready for redevelopment, and uh, then Public Works would take over uh, the site uh, where CBU currently uh, is uh, uh, exists, it currently exists. 
Thank you. And do we have any cost estimates as to what those moves are going to cost and where those funds are coming from? I didn't come prepared tonight to talk okay. about that. This was the topic of the evening was the showers. Right. And then are there any plans for the dollars that we've earmarked for public safety for police and fire going for the repurposing of showers? Are there other city entities that are planning on moving back there as well? Other, I'm sorry, can, other I city hear the end entities. Of like, is there any other department that's needing space that would come into the the, the purchased part of showers that's on the table? So right we now? don't have a plan for that at this time. However, if it makes sense to shift people around a little bit, um, as far as you know, sharing some of this space, um, that would that could that is a possibility. But it, the, certainly, the intent is that that would be space for public safety personnel. But additional so, personnel besides public safety personnel, any other city department that would be moving no. back there? No plans for that? No plans for that. All right, thank you. Round one. Let's move to round two. Council Member Volan. A um, couple of questions about uh, logistics and measurement. Um, we talk about common space. Um, it's always been my understanding that uh, the common space is part of the, the I mean, if, if somebody says there's 65,000 square feet, that's warts and all, common space and all, and either we're measuring uh, uh, apples to apples or we're not. So now I'm suddenly told that uh, uh, there won't be uh, as much to renovate because there's a lot of common space. Um, I mean, isn't that also true for the 20,000 square feet at headquarters. Uh, there's common space there that won't need to be renovated. Um, uh, can someone help me understand, uh, you know, like the, uh, the multiples I read in the, in the document that uh, Ms. Coons prepared and the architects before them, I thought assumed, uh, you know, I mean, let's put it this way, a new building, whether it's an expansion of the current site or an all new building, uh, Plan C, would have common space in it. We're building 35,000 square feet of new building, there's gonna be common space in it. Why is it that it's fair to count that, uh, but it's not fair to count the common space as part of the renovation cost? Who can answer that, I don't know. Deb Kuntz, uh, JS Held. So uh, in the cost estimates that I provided, the circulation space is included in those. So that is comparable, I think, to your assumption. I, I think, I'm not gonna speak for Larry, but I think the reference to the what is remainder in terms of the 40% is just to realize that not all of that 40% is rentable space. So I don't think it's about cost per square foot, it's about just recognizing that not all of that square footage that's remaining is actually rentable. That helps, I appreciate that. Sure. Um, the other question is about, maybe this is for you too, um, why if we were doing a plan B, would we renovate the existing building first? Why wouldn't we build the new building first and then once new functions could be put in there, then we'd renovate the existing building? In option, in the, in the plan B in a that you referenced? plan B, yeah. Yes, if we were phasing plan B, I would recommend that we build the new construction first and that we move folks from the existing construction into the new construction temporarily and then renovate. It possibly could renovate in two floors or maybe more, but there would be a minimum of probably two to three construction phases with the first, with the new construction being the longest phase. That's what I thought, that makes sense, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, oh, uh, and this I think is for the administration, thank you. Uh, last question I have is, um, I get the arguments that togetherness is better um, and that if the public safety departments were part of City Hall, uh, they would benefit, everyone would benefit from the circulation therein. But here we now are hearing about public works moving out of City Hall. Um, by the logic of this uh, togetherness, why not have all departments in one giant City Hall? Why should utilities be separate? Why should public works uh, leave City Hall? Isn't there a benefit to all of them being together in the same building? So that does seem like it would, Mary Catherine Carmichael, Deputy Mayor. Reno, so yeah. it does seem like that would make sense. And I, I certainly uh, track your logic on that. However, uh, we, I'm 
I'm smiling because I'm picturing all the equipment that they have in these like huge giant pipes, and cranes. I'm picturing them scattered, you know, out and about among uh, uh, around the fountain and everything. So they just they just have a requirement for so much more space to store equipment and vehicles and, uh, and those sorts of things. So it actually does make sense that they would be at a site that's more appropriate for that kind of um, work and that can accommodate those that kind of storage. Well, I've taken uh, to heart Chief Moore's point about the fire department headquarters uh, being co-located in City Hall would be a very positive thing due to all the interactions that they need to have with other uh, departments that aren't necessarily directly related to public safety. Um, but uh, why not have, I mean, right now we have the public works uh, headquarters here, and it would move down there. Why shouldn't the utilities headquarters be here, even if they, most of their staff is somewhere else? I mean, uh, it, it, doesn't that logic apply to any department, that the headquarters should be here? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think not necessarily. And utilities, you know, public utility, or City of Bloomington utilities is really kind of, uh, again, very equipment dependent. And so they also need that kind of uh, space to stretch out for storage and other things. Fire police aren't equipment dependent. They have to have whole stations. The fire department has whole stations to store equipment strategically located around the city. Right, so that's indoor storage, right? And it's in a fairly limited number of square feet where we're talking, we're not talking about like 20, or I don't even know, I don't know, uh, six foot uh, circumference of, of pipes and back, you know, Big equipment. They have why vehicles. Should the, go ahead. No, they have vehicles. Well, why, why shouldn't the, the leaders of each department maintain space in City Hall, such as we're recommending for fire and police? I mean, for police removing the whole department, but if fire removing just the admin, why not the rest of the departments? Well, I guess, again, it's just kind of the nature of the, the work. I, I'm not sure I have a good question, a good answer for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sandberg and then Council Member Piedmont Smith. Or wait, Council Member, have you had a turn? Let's do Council Member Piedmont Smith first. Oh, mine is a beg the question of what was just happened. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Well, let me beg the question because it's about <laughs> function. Function. I think this is a thing that is troubling me the most about trying to cram the police headquarters into a space that I think is perfectly suited for administrative purpose. But let's pose the question, would you expect a fire department to be back there with the bad ingress and egress and all the equipment that they have to have back there? And in, I don't know, they, the police don't have as big a rigs as the, as the fire department does, but the police have a special function that I do not see fitting in an administrative building. No matter how you try to say we can, we can fix it, we can, we can do exactly what they have in their Third Street headquarters right here in Showers. I'm, not, I'm, I'm having a hard time with the function and the very case you made about how public works, I think it's a brilliant idea. The public works goes where utilities is because that's where their fleet is. That's where their garages are. That makes perfect sense to me because it's the function of that department. I'm not seeing the function of why we all need to be under the same roof, again, singing kumbaya at the water cooler, when that's not what a police department does. They are not an administrative setup. They are very much on the ground and moving and dealing with all kinds of things that I just don't see suitable back here. So can anybody <laughs> answer that question about if we wouldn't put a fire station back here, why are we, why are we insisting that we put a police headquarters back, back yeah. here? Thank you for that question, it's a good one. And I think the distinction is between the police and fire is that the fire almost all the time dispatches from their fire station, right? But a, a police department does not necessarily dispatch from their station. Oftentimes, most of the time in fact, police um, are dispatched from wherever they are in the community. So that's why there is that difference. We have fire stations all across the city for fast response time to make sure we're, we're saving buildings that are on fire. And I know there's differences between the fire department and police, but I think we're not respecting 
the functionality of that headquarters where it is and trying to shoehorn it here in the showers that I just find inappropriate. I just don't understand the buy-in for we need to have police and fire. And I agree that a the fire administration could very well fit into the mm -hmm. addition on 3rd Street if, if that is necessary for better mm -hmm. police fire functioning. Yeah. I just don't see the connection with why it has to be attached to City Hall. Sure. I, I want a better explanation of that mm -hmm. before I can, I can go with Plan A, yeah. which right now is a hard no for me. Yeah, I understand. So I would challenge the assertion that this is a shoehorn when we're, it's actually an expansion. It's the opposite of a shoehorn. It's giving them more space. So um, yeah, I would just leave that there. Thank you. Additional round two questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Um, first, I wanted to clarify um, with Ms. Carmichael. Uh, I believe the mayor has taken off the table the idea of expanding um, at the current BPD headquarters. Is that true? It's my understanding that is not something he wishes to pursue. He doesn't see that as a good investment of public funds. Okay. So the plan B we keep talking about is really a revised plan B um, because we keep talking about the budget and such of plan B, but that includes expansion, which is off the table, at least under this mayor. That's my understanding. Um, and if I may ask another one, because it, it goes with what Councilmember Sandberg said, um, could uh, the, I, so I, I understand Public Works will uh, soon be moving into um, the City of Bloomington Utilities Building. I mean, it all takes time, I understand, but it, relatively soon. Um, would that not leave sufficient space here in City Hall uh, for the fire administration to use if, if the purchase of Showers West doesn't go forward? Wouldn't there s still be space in the current City Hall uh, for fire administration to occupy? Uh, I, you know, that isn't something I've heard discussed. I don't really think that, you know, if you've been in the public workspace, it's not much. It's really one, two, three little offices. So I don't think that that would actually accommodate their needs. Um, I don't know. Oh, Chief Moore, would you like to address that? Yes, thank you. Good evening, Jason Moore, Fire Chief. Uh, I've been in that office. There is no way. Uh, that is... <laughs> That is not going to happen. Uh, when you consider just the minimum square footage that we talked about was the 5,000, and that is not even considering any expansion, which this current plan has us set up for up to 7,500 without having to make major changes to the building after that. So that little office will not support what we have uh, currently. And again, I want to remind everyone, when I talk about administration, I'm not just talking about myself, the deputy chief, the assistant chief. It's prevention uh, personnel. It's our new community care programs, the mobile integrated health care. So we're talking in excess of about 20 staff members, not just three or four. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Thank that. you. Thank you. Additional round two questions. Council Member Smith. It's, it's, a con it's really a difficult thing for us to, to think about since we're, we're not professional planners, so there's a lot of different opinions going on, there's a lot of different analyses around. Um, so uh, there's, there's a report uh, and, uh, from the Inter International Association of Chiefs of Police um, that talks about the different steps used to develop a plan. Um, so I guess my question at large is, Did we go through a planning analysis and use a, st a standard that um, that would guide our selection of these sites? And um, I know we had expert analysis and uh, architectural help from uh, Ms. Kuntz, fantastic. Um, and I know that the administration has their opinions and we have ours. and. Uh, uh, Fraternal Order Police has theirs. So it's all kind of, you know, it's a challenge. Uh, and we're trying to make this good decision. Um, and so how did, how did we, what guidance did we follow to come to this conclusion? 
is what I'm trying to ask. Uh, it's a kind of a vague question there is, did, did, we, did we look at um, experts from the, uh, the police uh, and the development of facilities? Did we look at that and then, and then did we bring that in? I mean, I know it's kind of a vague question, but I don't know if anybody wants to take a stab at that, but how did, how did we do that? Um, um, the, uh, the report I'm looking at, you know, is really great as far as a guiding document on doing this development. Um, can you say something about that? Thank you. I, I was not, I wasn't, pers Deb Coons, JS Held, I wasn't personally involved in all of it, but I can tell you what I understand happened or my understanding of the process. And as, as I understand, and this obviously led with uh, Deputy Mayor Don Griffin, I think was a lead at that time, at first started with looking at what properties were available that the city already owned. Naturally, I think you'd always look at your own portfolio first in terms of that. And then uh, I understand that there was also an analysis of uh, feeling like those weren't any the best solutions. There's a proximity to consider. Uh, and then also looking at what could be maybe even for sale properties at that time. So I, I do understand that those things were involved. At what point uh, the other, any other professionals got involved, I couldn't say. Uh, obviously I know Spring Point was brought on and then Martin Riley for the fire station. But uh, it, those questions would probably have to be directed to others in terms of whether there were other professionals involved at that time. And I see people conferring. I, is, is there additional response to Council Member Smith? Oh. I mean, I actually wanted to ask Ms. Coons to just cite her own expertise. Like, you have experience designing public safety buildings. Uh, maybe that counts as who's an expert for Council Member Smith's matters? Yes, I mean, we have, we definitely have involvement as an owner's rep on several public safety facilities, as I've mentioned before, Carmel and Lafayette are the probably two most notable. Um, uh, I, I will say for the record, I was not involved in the analysis of different, all, you know, a bunch of different properties for these considerations. So I would just note that for the record, so. Uh, just very briefly, Larry, I was Assistant City Attorney. So early on, uh, when we were looking at, uh, I, Deb's exactly right, we were looking at a variety of properties to see what was feasible, but that's one of the reasons why we also brought on Spring Point Architects specifically. So as you know, through your reports that you all received, we've had various specialists look at the building for a variety of uses. Spring Point was brought on specifically so that we could find someone that's CALEA certified, the CALEA process, which is the certification process, as I understand it, for police departments. And one of the things they specialize in is the way police departments work, the flow of it. That's why Deb has been integral in bringing them into that conversation about, about their report, about their analysis, and whether it would work for a police department. So in terms of that specialized knowledge that you're looking for, did we look at that? That's exactly why they were brought on to add that, as opposed to, for instance, Tabor Bruce, which we had look at the general mechanics of the building, how what shape it was in, just generally from an architectural standpoint. We felt like we needed a specialized uh, architect and somebody that's that's experienced in that particular certification to under to evaluate the property for its potential use. Thank you. Additional round two questions. If not, I'll take a turn. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Allo, go ahead. Uh, let's see, I, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, I'll, let me follow up on something you uh, mentioned a moment ago, which is that the mayor is opposed to expansion uh, on site. Um, and I'd like to drill down a little bit more and know why that is specifically. Uh, I would say that he indicated in an email on December 2nd that we received from him that he states that the renovation uh, would occur in under plan B if we did not purchase the showers west side, um, but not the expansion. Um, he, he notes the cost, but what I'm wondering is if the cost is actually much less than we assume. So the cost is, say, toward the end, toward the scale of what the police union is, is suggesting. Some $600,000. That frees up a lot of funds to do an expansion. 
Um, furthermore, it is also evident that we don't need a parking garage there for 15 cars, uh, that we can find parking elsewhere. So that, that for, frees up $2 million just, the, just right there. Is, is it the cost? So if, if the cost is, if, if we can, if this could be accommodated by the, by the funds um, that we have available, um, is this the only thing that is standing in the way of the expansion or are there other reasons? So I think that over the overarching thought about uh, the existing facility would be uh, any additional investment in that location is kind of good money after bad based on the condition of the existing building and then you have to fix that and then you, ha and then the, you want to build on. And I think that we have probably a fairly fundamental disagreement about the numbers, the estimate on what it would cost to redo that. So I, your general, your first, your, the basis of your assertion we probably don't agree on. Um, and I think location is also an issue. It is just so landlocked. Uh, in that current location, uh, hard up against a park. Uh, so that is not seen as ideal either. So you fundamentally disagree with the police again, because they say a 15,000 square foot addition uh, onto the existing headquarters is more than sufficient. 10,000 square feet for them, 5,000 square feet for a uh, fire department administration. For the, for the foreseeable future, you just fundamentally disagree that a 30,000 square foot police station is inadequate. So I think that what we're looking at with showers is the ability to expand over time. We continue to think that's important. Um, the, the lack of ability to do that at the other side is huge. But really, again, I'm just trying to circle back to um, the question on the floor tonight for us is primarily about this purchase. No, not from, I, I know not from you me. want to get into the, the details of, yeah. of, of your renovation plan, um, but I'm, I'm not prepared to do that. Well, he did, he notes plan B in that email. So this is under consideration. It was under consideration of the committee. So okay. thank you. Thank you. Did I miss anyone for round two? Okay, if not. I'd like to hear your questions before we do any okay. more. Um, Mostly to Mr. Allen, I think, on this question. Um, and it's a, very, it's a very big picture question, but I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. Um, what is being proposed is the purchase of Showers West with the proceeds of the bonds that we have signed, correct? Okay. Those bonds, when we, when we approved the issuance of those bonds, we approved a list of projects that went with it, which included investments in public safety, correct? That's correct. So is it accurate to say that, that however, however much we, we may want showers and however much it could add to our stock of space, the way to afford it <laughs> and to have the resources to buy it is to actually put public safety in there. Is that accurate? That's also accurate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I also have, uh, actually I have another question I'll come back to another time. So Council Member Volan. Before I ask my question, I saw Chief Dikoff wanted to say something about the question Councilman Borallo asked, and I wanted to hear what he what he had to say. Isn't that well? Then come on up anyway and tell us what you were thinking. That's what I wanted to know. It's like rapid fire questions tonight. Mike Dikoff, Police Chief. Um, what I would like to say is that we need a new building. We need new space. Um, the showers purchase. Um, you know, we're currently sitting in 20,000 square feet. The showers purchase initially, as is without any future expansion, gives us 30,000 square feet. So we're increasing the size of our, our location already. Showers provides us the opportunity to expand in the future. Uh, we, don't, we don't know what's going to happen with annexation. So um, an addition at our current facility, I, I think that landlocks us more. I don't think that we can have future expansion at that location if we build, you know, three floors and, and add 10,000 square feet. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on that is, is with, with the financing and all that that is way above me, but I just wanted to make clear that, you know, we need a new space. Showers is a space that, that we can make work. 
it allows us to have future expansion, which is something that I think we really need to think about. Um, and so I just, I just wanted to kind of express that so that, um, again, the financing stuff is for all you to figure out. I'm just talking about what our needs are at the police department, and we, we need space. Was there a follow-up or, or what? So the other question I had was, um, uh, I think it's for Chief Moore. Um, I understood early on in this discussion that, uh, in the discussion of the bond itself, that there were substantial, a substantial backlog of capital needs in fire. I know that Station 1, of course, needs to be completely rehabbed. Uh, we're looking at a, maybe a new Station 3. Wasn't Station 4 also uh, a concern of yours, too? Thank you for the question. So I think what, what's important is um, we had to triage. There's only so much money. Uh, we have an engineering study that showed that four, or technically it was three of our five stations needed to be replaced. The flood added station one, which was only due for a major remodel prior to the flood. Um, so we now have four of the five stations that were due for replacement. Understanding the limitations of even adding the extra revenue to do projects with this bond, uh, we've already made some very hard choices, and several of the stations using PS lit funds have undergone some very significant or in the process of being uh, significantly renovated to get us through another 5, 10, 15 years uh, until we could re potentially renew bonds to, to look at that. Um, the other thing that we've got to wait to settle out for us is annexation. Um, so if all that happens, depending on how this plays out, that may need, stations need to be in different locations, additional stations were supposed to be built, um, so there's a lot of unanswered questions for us. So where we're at now, the flood put this at the front end of our priority list. Um, but yes, uh, whether we get a new station three or we invest, I think somewhere in the realm of two to $3 million for renovating the current station three, which is not perfectly ideal, but within the limitations of our finances, those are all things that we're discussing. Um, station three was heard by you. And, uh, I understand that um, it's not an ideal building either, and that um, if uh, we could afford it, you would prefer a new Station 3 as opposed to a renovated one. Would that then move because the current location is inappropriate? Um, I think if, if we all had our dreams, yes, we would definitely move. Uh, we have already done due diligence on a potential site. IU has asked us not to discuss that potential site just for a lot of reasons. Um, but we've actually already done due diligence on a potential new site that would improve response times and give us a better service uh, to other portions of the city as well. Uh, but again, with the limitations and the current construction cost, it was not a feasible option uh, at this moment because of the overall costs. So the renovation of Station 3 was the next best option. Okay, and finally, uh, on the same theme, um, should annexation come to pass, wouldn't it be reasonable to assume that any new station built in or near the annexed area would be funded substantially by a new bond that comes from taxes raised on the annexed areas, or the taxes that would already be coming in from them? I, I believe that was a part of the annexation planning, is that the new revenues would help provide those additional capital costs that by statute had to be provided with X number of years. Um, so yes, all that would be considered. And again, there's a lot of moving pieces to that, but um, I, I think to answer your question plainly, yes, there should be other revenue sources should we need to expand or add new stations should annexation go through. So I don't know if this is for you or for anybody else, but uh, is it then the case that the bond we passed last month uh, is basically it for improvements to public safety for the near term? Like we have to figure out what we can do with these monies um, and that anything else beyond fi uh, fixing existing stations or building a new headquarters is the limit uh, this money is the limit of how we can fix those things. I, I think the plan you were given was the balance of how can we do the most for the, for the least amount? How can we serve the greatest good of both departments uh, with the limited resources we have? So any particular project goes over, then that means it takes away from the rest. That's very well put. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith and Council Member Sandberg. Yes, um, this is uh, probably for Ms. Carmichael. Um, the, if, if this body does not approve the purchase of Showers West, does that 
leave more money from the bond to address the fire department's needs, or how would the administration redistribute the funds? Yes. Yes, so, so. Yes, it, it does leave more money to address fire department needs. Okay. Um, if, do you have any details of, have you done a contingency plan? You know, we're plan optimists. We're hoping this goes through, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it, but we, yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to address this now? We've got some time left. Good evening. So I think the, the thing that I've Could heard Could you identify yourself just for those who are listening? Every time. That's fine. Yep. Jason Moore, Fire Chief. Um, I think when, when we discussed the Plan B internally, that if this did not go through, what would be the, the, the outcome? Um, that uh, the potential of a new Station 3 may come back on the table. Um, so that, that was a minor renovation of the current police headquarters, and Station 3 may actually come back online as a, a viable option. So that's the internal discussions that we were previewed to as far as the, the plan B from administration. Thank you. Mike Decoff, Police Chief. I would, um, uh, the mayor's made it clear that he doesn't intend to add on to the current station, so if this doesn't happen, then we will be, uh, we will obviously stay in our current facility with the same um, conditions and square footage and we won't, uh, we won't be able to grow. Um, I, I'm sorry, uh, could, could I do a follow up with Chief Moore? Uh, so, um, uh, when you were talking about potential plan B, or at least the conversations you were involved with. Um, so the, that plan would leave more money for fire, and you said that station three replacement would, would be possible, feasible. Um, what about where um, the uh, fire department administration would go? What is that backup plan? Yeah, that, that was less desirable. Um, so our, our backup, if this does not go through, is that with the training logistics facility, which is on the very so far south of the city limits, is that's where we would have to consider building. Uh, there would be another potential we could consider if we get a new station three that we may be able to add ourselves to that. Um, but it will have to go with one of the, the other projects. Uh, there is not enough square footage, even with the, the uh, renovation of station one, for all of our administration to go back. Um, I will remind council that, again, when we talk about our administration, it's just not just the few chiefs. Um, prior to this uh, flood, our administration has been spread out all over the city. The use of a temporary headquarters has allowed us all to come under one roof, and we've actually given that space back to the crews. Those stations were designed for the crews, and then through uh, decisions of the city administration in the past, they've actually given up some of our space, which forced our department to give uh, administrative space and take away from the operational crews and spaces that was already designed. Um, I, I see a slightly puzzled look. I think the, uh, the Lotus uh, building was one of our buildings and it was given away by a prior administration. Um, so again, just everything has a consequence. But what I do know is that having everyone under the same roof is, has been beneficial for us. And you know, again, moving forward, we'd like to keep that, whether it's at the south of the city, which is bad for, again, I think internally we've talked about it for the other customers that use our services for building design, plan review. Um, they have to make multiple stops, and that would actually add a new stop that is way further away from even where we're at now. Thank you. Councilmember Sandberg. Thank you. Actually, this question is a Jeff Underwood question, and I don't think he's with us this evening on Zoom. but. Um, I'm really concerned about this. If you don't go with our plan A, we're going to maybe short shrift plan B and not do the addition that the, that the police would need, the headquarters would need. So I want to go back to a question of funding. I want to ask about the PS lit because, of course, we very carefully earmarked the public safety dollars from the ED lit for the specific use of police and fire, making sure those dollars can 
uh, go toward the absolute best we can do for both departments and for the safety of the city. We've heard early on in this meeting how important public safety is to the chamber and, and everyone who lives here. I would like a full accounting of the PS lit dollars and why we seem to be tapped out there because it seems like we really have two pots of money that could go for police and fire. The ED lit, which we carefully earmarked for public safety in one of those buckets for which we raise taxes, and then the PS lit, which we didn't, which we have done uh, a while back. So who, who can kind of give us a general overview of how those dollars are allocated? Oh, Mr. Underwood, you are here with us. Thank you. Please explain to me why we're tapped out with the PS lit and why that can't be a contributing factor to these needs for both police and fire that clearly are obvious. Uh, well, I will, I will give you the, the accounting side of things and then the two chiefs are there as well. Uh, as you know, um, we get allocated public safety dollars uh, every year. Uh, the public safety, we get estimates from the state on what those public safety dollars will be. Uh, the public safety subcommittee meets and uh, reviews needs of both the um, central dispatch, the, the public safety answering point, uh, then uh, allows for other uh, departments outside of the four, uh, Steinsville, Ellsville, Monroe County, and City of Bloomington uh, to request funds. Those are reviewed. Uh, we've not allocated, uh, we, the committee has not allocated those dollars. And then they fall to those four units uh, based on the allocation factor. Uh, each year, we present to you a 10-year public safety lit budget uh capital plan uh obviously we fund that current year uh and as noted over the years we've always had more needs than than uh, enough revenues to fund all of the necessary things uh, they've primarily gone to uh capital related uh items uh we've been able to uh catch up both police and fire and, and get them current on equipment replacements uh, we're about ready to cycle back through that. Uh, the, the two chiefs are there and, and can speak to that. So there's not been an excess of funds in those. Uh, in fact, it, there has actually been more needs than there has been funding available. Uh, certainly it's gone primarily to equipment. There's been some rehabilitation that's been done at both uh, police and fire, uh, as well as the uh, uh, construction of the large evidence building uh, down on the south side. So um, we give you an accounting of that each budget year of what, what uh, is requested and what's been spent uh, and what is projected over um, the next nine years. There's also a column on that that says unfunded uh, and many of the uh, capital uh, re expenses related to buildings or uh, rehabs of those buildings uh, have been listed in that last 11th column, so to speak. Uh, and with that, I'll let the chiefs um, take a turn if they would like to. Thank you. Jason Moore, Fire Chief. Uh, I believe when you were sitting here talking about the passage of the ED lit, um, I was speaking against trying to use PS lit funds for these things. Um, you know, again, those have been what, what uh, Controller Underwood mentioned is there's funding to maintain the 10-year plan, and that, that will keep us stable, that will keep us from ever getting to the point where you have a fire chief standing in front of you talking about the holes in their truck, uh, where trucks don't start and all these other issues. Um, and we were very set against uh, using PS lit funds for these bigger projects that will tie up that money for 20 years or more, um, for like bonds. So for us, those PS lit dollars have been, been uh, you know, groundbreaking and changing of our department. Um, the ED lit was, again, what Controller Underwood said, was for all those unfunded items. And I still want to point out that even with the passage of that bond, there are still unfunded needs. So this was, again, we're, we're just making bite-sized pieces of a very big problem. And uh, we would not want to try to use PS lit funds to help, you know, soften the blow or fund these other projects because then something else would not get done that has already been planned. Decoff, police chief. Um, if you'll remember to budget times each year, PS Lit is used heavily to replace a lot of our equipment. 
Um, we, we have uh, radio systems that, uh, you know, they only last so many years and we replace radios regularly, uh, protective gear for the officer. So we, we rely on that, those funds um, to do yearly replacement costs for the day-to-day the -day equipment that the officers are using. Um, as the controller stated, um, we have used funds to build our large evidence storage facility south of town. Um, but there's not any money left over in that PS lit fund. I think that we could we could put towards um, any kind of building project. Um, if you'll remember, over the years there have been past discussions about using um, PS lit money to hire more officers, um, and we didn't do that either because the equipment needs for the current officers um, were seen as, as a more important thing. Um, and you know the city has, the city administration has invested heavily in um, uh, public safety by with the latest contract we raise salaries we're, we're putting money towards recruiting trying to get more officers so we've we've come up with other ways to try to um, get our staffing level numbers back up where they they should be um, by not using PS lip by using other funds that the city has so if I could just ask if I could follow up to finding the fiscal situation we're in now where we're finding a real great need to do right by the police and the fire departments here, should we have raised the ED lit in the public safety bucket? Did we not allocate enough? Well, I'm, I, don't, I don't get that much of the weeds with raising those types of funds. Um, um, I don't know, maybe we, sh we should look at that. Maybe we should, thank you. Thank you, additional questions? Okay, if not, I'll jump in. Um, this is for Deputy Mayor Carmichael, please. Um, I, I think it's pretty universally understood that the traffic patterns around a police station have the potential to be very different than traffic patterns elsewhere in town. So I'm interested to know what the administration has done or what kind of conversations have been had with neighbor with the neighborhoods in close proximity to showers mm -hmm. um, again it, the third street and just to frame the question further the third street location empties onto some pretty sizable streets it borders a park it borders some commercial areas this has some really close proximity to some very dense neighborhoods and I'm wondering what kind of feedback or what kind of conversations have been had with those neighborhoods about the impact that a police lo locating police and fire here would have on them. Yeah, I would say that the current station actually does have some residential around it, really close is the Rise, Middle Way House, um, apartments are there along, oh God, I always get Lincoln and Washington mixed up. Anyway, there are apartment buildings uh, in that area to, in close proximity. So it, it too has residential close in. Um, I would hope that the uh, uh, neighborhoods nearby, uh, the near west side here, would be pleased to have the fire, or I'm sorry, well, police and fire, uh, located closer to their neighborhood. Um, just, you know, it's nice to have public safety in your area, so I would hope they would welcome that. Um, we haven't done any deep engagement with them. That's a good point. We should do that. So thanks for mentioning that. I can say that um, we have neighbors at our current facility that aren't always so happy with us when we test our sirens and stuff, um, which is done three times a day. So. Any additional questions? Okay, if not, let's go to public comment. So, Mr. Lucas, if you could make an announcement on Zoom, please. Yes, if there are members of the public on Zoom that would like to offer comment on this appropriation ordinance, please use the raise hand uh, function to let us know. You can find that in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to comment. Okay, and anyone in chambers, please approach the podium if you would like to offer comment on appropriation ordinance 2206. Seeing none, Mr. Lucas, any on Zoom? Yes, we have Paul Post. Okay. Mr. Post, welcome. If you would confirm your name for the record, please, and then you'll have three minutes. 
Uh, good evening, council members. Paul Post, president of FOP Lodge 88. Uh, I apologize, I couldn't be with you in person tonight. I have COVID and I'm quarantining at home. Despite feeling pretty crummy, I am still wanting to participate and convey the views of our membership. First, we again thank the administration and the council for focusing on wanting to make public safety improvements for police and fire buildings. These are much needed and will improve the working conditions of your public safety employees. Second, thank you for letting us have a role in this process. When the mayor announced his plan for purchasing the Showers West building, that was a decision made without input from the day-to-day -day users. When we spoke up in opposition to the plan, you listened to our concerns and invited us to actively participate in the meetings where the committee weighed the decision. We appreciate that opportunity. And now tonight we ask you make the common sense decision and reject this purchase. We've polled the membership about this move and the response was an overwhelming no to that location. We've explained to you our concerns with the location, the ingress and egress problems and the lack of quick access to main roads. In addition to those hurdles, we've learned that the mayor plans to leave the lease units as well for income generating properties. There then remains the question of where those funds would go, which we've talked about tonight and I appreciate that. We've pointed out that there are more financially responsible options to the showers purchase. We've pointed out that the estimates showing renovation and our expansion at the current police department or the idea of building new somewhere else were greatly inflated to better push you into purchasing the shower site. We provide you with information from other sources about construction and the current climate and feel that the idea of building a brand new purpose built police department in a new location has been well overlooked. We understand the time crunch the fire department is facing with the potential loss of the ISO one rating. Now that the bond issue has been started, the funding is in place to start first with the needs of the fire department. Reject the showers purchase and spend some time exploring the best option for moving forward with the police building. We are not under the same time pressure as the fire department. Let's work together to make a plan for the police department that will best serve the city for decades to come. Council members, thank you for your time and the attention you have given this issue. Please say no to the purchase of the showers building using public safety funds. If the city wants to pursue that purchase later in a different manner, go for it. But don't try to shoehorn a police department into a space where it clearly won't fit. There are too many logistical hurdles and unneeded expenses with that location just to settle for something because the mayor told you to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Post. I'm not seeing anyone here in chambers wanting to make comment. Mr. Lucas, is there anyone else on, on Zoom? Yes, ne uh, next is Jeff Rogers. Mr. Rogers, welcome. Please confirm your name for the record and you'll have three minutes. Good evening, council members. This is Jeff Rogers, representative of the FOP and members of the Bloomington Police Department. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I apologize also that I can't be there in person this evening. Like Mr. Post, I also want to say thank you to each one of you for taking the time to obtain additional information on this project prior to taking a vote on this matter. This council has shown several times over the past few years that you do support the police and the advancement of the Bloomington Police Department into the future, so thank you. Um, I and other members of the FOP have expressed our concerns in length over the purchase of the showers building and then the relocation of the police department to that building. The mayor's administration has stated several times at council meetings, on virtual meetings with the FOP and in other public meetings that he wants a police department that is built using best practice standards similar to other police departments in the country. There also have been several conversations about the category four risk rating for a public safety building. The administration has already stated that if the showered building is chosen for a police department, it will not be upgraded to a category four building. Now, while this is allowed, the state building commissioner has stated that while there are minimum standards, it is best practice to build public safety structures such as police and fire departments to meet category four standards. The location with limited access, the extreme cost of the building, and the fact that the building is being purchased with public safety funds, but only half the building will be used for public safety. All of these are reasons not to put the police department on the west side of the showers building. A study of the vehicular traffic from the west side of the showers building showed that 67% of it will cross the B line. Is it really responsible of the city to put a police department in this location and not be willing to reroute the B line or create a bridge similar to the one located at Grimes Lane and Morton Street in order to avoid future accidents? 
You're spending over $23 million and you want to return for your money. A new building brings you a 40 year old building. The same way would translate renovating the existing police department and you would end up with a hundred year old building. And the same way, if you did the showers building, that would translate with a 40 year old building or what you expected out of $23 million, you would end up with a 150 year old building. What would you like to spend your $23 million on? Please reject this purchase. Put public safety funds towards station one and station three now. Take the proper time to research a future police department and use documents such as that police facility planning guidelines from the International Association of Chiefs of Police as an example on how to move forward. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Mr. Lucas, additional comments on Zoom? That I see, no. And seeing none here in chambers, let's come back to council for additional questions. And I'd, I'd like to uh, ask if it's time for me to introduce an amendment. Mr. Lucas, do you want to provide some context for amendment. the amendments? That, what, I'm sorry? Just be introduced. What context before? That, that's fine. Please go ahead. I have an amendment one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, I'm the sponsor of it. And it, what it does is it uh, removes the showers building from uh, the purchase. And what else do I need to do, uh, council members or President uh, um, Skimbler? If, if uh, Mr. Lucas, I, I believe, just as our attorney, you may have some guidance for us on the impact of removing the purchase, well, of, the purchase of showers property in particular from this ordinance, I, this app ordinance. Yes, yeah, Stephen Lucas, council administrator and attorney. Um, <clears throat> the amendment would uh, revise the appropriation ordinance to remove language related to uh, approval of the Redevelopment Commission's uh, purchase agreement. So there would be a revision to the title, uh, a deletion of the sixth whereas clause. Uh, it would insert a new sentence into section one of the appropriation ordinance to read uh, as follows, such appropriation shall not include payment of costs associated with the acquisition of any portion of the property comprising the existing showers building complex not currently owned by the city. Uh, it would delete the existing section two in its entirety, which uh, uh, approves of the Redevelopment Commission's purchase agreement. <clears throat> and the intent, I believe, is to uh, uh, remove the um, uh, provisions in the ordinance related to approving the Redevelopment Commission's purchase agreement and to make clear that if, if the additional appropriation contained herein is, is approved, that it does not include uh, any payment uh, of these bond proceeds toward the purchase of the Showers Building. Um, I certainly encourage you to check with the administration as to uh, uh, what they see as the impact of this, but that's the intent and that's what the uh, amendment says. Thank you. Council Member Volum. Um, so with this amendment, if it's the will of the council to not make a decision tonight, can we postpone the whole app board through a motion to postpone the amendment? Or do we have to dispense with the amendment before we can uh, move to postpone? I mean, I don't see how, like if the, the amendment is key to the overall app board, do you see what I mean? If, if I'm reading, uh, if I'm understanding your question and, and you're uh, thinking that the uh, purchase of the showers building is the crux of the issue, I would certainly encourage the council to, uh, if you need additional time to think about that, uh, not vote on the amendment tonight, uh, but we, but post, but postponing the entire appropriation ordinance uh, before action on the amendment would be what you'd want to do, I believe. But we can, we, we can postpone in the, in the, uh, the whole um, uh, ordinance in the course of yes. debating the amendment. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. So, additional questions? Council Member Sandberg. So the amendment which would remove showers from consideration tonight, what would that effectively do? It just say the, the public safety dollars that have been earmarked out of the ED lit could then be applied to the needs of the fire uh, department? I mean, I'm, I've heard in public comment that their needs are much more urgent at this point than, than thinking about a, a BPD headquarters, which we may need to take more time. Is that the intent of this, is to 
or, or does it not direct where any of the appropriations in the bond that has been approved would go? The interpretation was it did not direct it anywhere except removing the showers building from consideration. So it's still on the table as to how we're going to address the needs of police and fire. Yes. So it's plan B and or whatever. Yeah. So you could start with the fire department and do that and expend the funds later for something else. Well, oh. now I'm confused because it really doesn't direct anybody to spend any kind of money. It just says no, put but, a hold. But you could. We're not ready to make this decision. Is that Correct. Right? Yeah. Right. Okay. And if I may follow up on that. Well, actually, let's go to Ms. Kate first. So. Uh, Beth Kate Corporation Council, and I'm also going to, I think, call on uh, Brad Bingham from Barnes uh, to weigh in on this. But when you approve the bond ordinance, as you may recall, there is an exhibit attached to the bond ordinance which describes generally and broadly public safety projects that the bond proceeds would uh, then, once they were appropriated, be available for. Uh, and so I think what you would end up with is the ability to dedicate the funds once you appropriate them to projects in that list. Okay. Does that help? And Brad, I don't know if you want to jump in uh, to add anything to yeah, that. This, yeah, Brad Bingham here, born Bornberg. Uh, hopefully you can see me. I can't see myself on here. Uh, I, I think that's, that is an interesting question because the way the, way the appropriation ordinance is set up is it says, um, it's like in the first whereas clause, it, it, it says that it, it cross-references the projects, the projects as defined in the bond ordinance. In, in, in the current appropriation ordinance, it says that the, the uh, dollars are appropriated for those projects. And, and I think, uh, as Corporation Council Beth Kate mentioned, it does create this, this oddity. I, I do think, however, that, that by amending the appropriation ordinance, if, if it were to uh, occur the way uh, Mr. Lucas described the amendment, that, in my mind, would, would trump the bond ordinance. So, in other words, you would look to the appropriation ordinance to say, what are the restrictions therein? And, and if it were to say, uh, the proceeds shall not be used for to purchase showers or any renovations thereof, that is controlling. So, so again, the bond ordinance has an exhibit A with a very broad uh, description of potential projects for, for which the proceeds could be used for. This appropriation ordinance is the real discrete authority upon which projects the proceeds can be spent. Does that does that make sense or answer that question? Does that help? I, I agree with, with what Brad said. I just want to be clear. I, I agree that if you say no to the showers complex as part of amending this ordinance, that that's off the table, and then everything else that is reflected uh, and available uh, would would be available, right? And the bond ordinance had a uh, very broad description of that, and the uh, app ord would continue, I think, to contain projects that uh, that reflect what was originally conceived. Right. So. All the other projects are game. Yeah. Yes. And did I understand you correctly? So you would come back to us with another app ord for whatever projects were prioritized, other than showers. I don't no. So. If, if you're looking for, i sorry, Corporation Council Bathgate, right? Um, if you're, you're looking for a new prioritization list, uh, then I would imagine we could provide that. But I think, the, I, if I understand, and Brad, again, correct me if I'm going astray here, but the, the original bond ordinance described the projects that the uh, funds could be put to in a, in a broad way. Uh, for public, various public safety projects. And for the app board, if you remove one, uh, the others are still going to remain. If you want something that looks different or with more uh, specificity, then we can come back with that if that's what you're asking for. So thank you. I, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mr. Lucas? Maybe this has already been explained, but uh, section one of the appropriation ordinance uh, states that uh, $29.5 million is appropriated uh, for the purpose of providing funds to pay for the costs of the police and fire department projects. Uh, the projects that it's referring to, as Mr. Bingham uh, noted, are referenced up above in the first whereas clause, and uh, are these projects listed here in the exhibit A to the bond ordinance. Uh, I think Mr. Bingham was referring to uh, item C here in the bond ordinance, uh, which includes as a permissible project uh, the acquisition of real property 
including any portion of the property comprising the existing showers building complex not currently owned by the city. And so the amendment uh, attempts to clarify uh, that proceeds are not being appropriated for that purpose and the council is not approving of that, of the purchase agreement of the RDC. Uh, but the remaining projects on this list are what the appropriation would go toward, or could, be, could go toward. Thank you. Additional questions? Is there public comment then on Amendment 1? If you would, please approach the podium while you're signing in. Mr. Lucas, if you could make the announcement on Zoom. Yes, if there are members of the public on Zoom that want to comment on this amendment, please use the raise hand feature to let us know. You can find that in your control bar under the Reactions tab or the More tab, or you can send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. Good evening. I'll make this quick. This is Christopher M.G. from the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. We appreciate the discourse. In the study of this issue, the Chamber takes no formal view on this uh, sale from the sale of uh, the CFC property. Uh, the West Showers building, but we do believe the postponement is in order. I think as we've gone through the debate, it's gotten a little bit more confusing um, to the point where I think I know less now than I, I did before. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. MG. <laughs> so, Mr. Lucas, do we have anyone on Zoom? No, not that I see. Okay. We have an amendment and a second before us. Is there a vote? Is there a motion? Mr. Volan? I, I just thought that at the very least before we, are we back to the question? Is there no uh, council? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Discussion My fault. of it? Yes. Just as a point of order, I, I feel like, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to move to postpone, but I'd like to say a thing or two and, and get the sense of council because I, I agree with Mr. Emji that this is a weighty matter and I, don't yet feel like I felt in December that I can decide tonight. Um, but uh, uh, so yeah, I'd like to make sure we have discussion. Good, uh, thank before you. Before a vote to postpone. Additional comment, Council Member Sandberg. Well, I, I would certainly be in support of the amendment because I'm not in favor of the showers for the purpose in which it's being proposed. That said, if it's the will of this body to postpone because the public has not had an opportunity to understand what we're doing here, or we ourselves have more questions that resulted from what we have talked about tonight, a postponement may be in order. We are down a council member tonight, I, I might uh, note, and uh, postponement might be um, uh, f advisable with respect to that. Thank you. Additional comments, Council Member Rollo. I have a point of order. So we're suggesting that we have a postponement before we take a vote on the, on the amendment. Is that correct? Is that? I'm sorry? Is that what you're proposing, uh, Council Member Volant? I was going to say as part of my to, comments that I was going to move to postpone. I see. Okay. Yes. So, um, but you would like the discussion at this point? To, I think to, this is the moment for us to synthesize what we've heard tonight. Okay. Then I, then I will take a, a crack at it just briefly. So. Um, I'm in favor of the amendment. Um, I toured the police station uh, with several of my colleagues uh, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, uh, Councilmember Volan and Councilmember Piedmont Smith, and um, I sought to understand their specific needs relevant to the to the renovation. Um, what I what I gathered was that the the, the renovation was very minimal to suit their needs. Um, it was removing a wall or placing a door. It wasn't, it wasn't a $5 million warranted renovation. So it, it put me on guard to be very questioning about the, the numbers that, have been, that we have been given. Um, the changes just seem minimal in terms of the renovation costs. In fact, as, as we all know, the, the police identify $600,000 for the renovation, most of which would be the a perimeter drain, which would prevent any future flooding, which would be about $400,000. So $200,000 devoted. Now, I don't know. I'm not an architect, and I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, I don't do building construction, but it seems to me that what they were describing was closer to that than it would be many multiple millions of dollars. So that's one thing to consider. The other thing is, uh, the police are unanimous in their desire to stay in place. 
and in total opposition to moving to the Showers building. Now, there are exceptions, and I would say, and I'll just be frank, I think anyone who serves at the pleasure of the mayor must be reserved in their comments. Um, and that is the context that we must understand their, their, their answers. I'll, I'll say no more. Um, I, I think that they, they, they say a couple of things. Uh, they say more than a couple, but I'll just I'll, I'll describe two. And they said it today in the HT. Um, they're in a hardened building of steel and concrete block that was built specifically to be a police station in the mid-1960s. It has served that public, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, use uh, initially before it was turned into a city hall. Um, it is, furthermore, it's not exposed as the shower, the west side of the showers is, uh, with its entire facade of, of windows. So they're concerned about um, the structure and the durability of the structure. They're concerned also about the safety concerns of that exposure. Um, and another concern of theirs is, is of course, accessibility. The ingress, egress concerns, I think, can't be uh, uh, really discounted. Um, there was a call while we were there, and I noticed that several police officers were out the door in their squad cars and on Third Street within seconds. And I was told by an officer, I can't remember her name, but she said, you know, seconds matter. When, when we're on emergency calls, if I get to somebody and, it, and we're delayed in the process, it can cost them their lives. And so it is a very, very serious thing. Um, so another concern, as I said, is about the hardened structure, and I think this was uh, demonstrated in a, in a very good column by Dave Askins of the B-Square Bulletin, um, that we ought to be considering the longevity of the building, as uh, Detective Ryder said. Also, the, the durability in the case, in, in the event of an emergency, a disaster, for instance, tornado and, uh, or earthquake, now, this building cannot be made to level four. We don't know if the existing building is level four. Um, that information hasn't been forthcoming. Uh, I intuit that it's a, it's a more durable building than the Showers building if it were hit by a tornado, since it's made of concrete block and, and steel. Um, but the addition would be, if we had an addition that could be, that would be required to be level four. So we would have uh, 15,000 square feet of a level four building that would survive, which is very important in the case of a, of a disaster. Um, so what I'm seeing here is, I think uh, Council Member Sandberg really nailed it. She said, shoehorning of public safety into the showers. I think that's really an appropriate term. And as Councilmember Scambaluri questioned, reveals that the purchase of the shower, of course, wouldn't happen without police and fire expenditures funding it. So the driver, it seems to me, is the purchase of the showers building. And the means to do it is simply to shoehorn the police and fire into it as a means of doing it. Um, that seems to me backwards in the terms of our prioritization of, of a police facility. Um, so to conclude, I would just say what I've, what I've determined is that the renovation cost is a gross overestimate, uh, as is the new construction costs are highballed in, in, in the case that we've been given. Um, and meanwhile, the best practice costs, as prescribed by Kessel Booz, uh, such as ballistic glass, were reduced by one-third from the consultant report. So that's been reduced in order to bring parity or uh, make, make them uh, sort of even for, for, the, for our choice, I suppose. But it's not a choice, actually, because we're, we're told that the administration will not expand the police. So it, it's, a, it's a form of coercion, I think. So I'm afraid we'll end up with an infinite, inferior facility that's less durable for emergencies if we go ahead with the showers per, uh, purchase, and it present, presents real difficulties for police accessibility, which is important for them, and no doubt why they unanimously oppose it. 
So uh, those are my comments for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Council Member Smith. Well, I, of course I support the amendment because I helped author it or uh, am the co-sponsor or sponsor of it. Uh, I, uh, two things really still bother me. I think we're over, over buying um, the additional um, 20, 28,000 square feet um, we're trying to be good stewards of the people's tax dollars. Um, so that really bothers me in a big way. And then, and then that the uh, rank and file uh, officers think that uh, <clears throat> that would be, uh, that building would really not work. Um, and uh, those two things have really uh, kept me thinking that uh, I'm just gonna have a hard time ever supporting the showers uh, as a uh, police facility. Um, so anyway, that's about all I have to say. I just wanted to make sure I... Thank you. Additional comments? Oh, Council Member Piedmont Smith? What? I was gonna say I, I need a minute so if somebody else could go first, I would appreciate it. Council Member Sandberg. Well, I will just say, and of course, I am known to be someone who goes to the source to ask the people who are gonna be directly impacted by any 30 million and change decision we're gonna make up here, and that's to talk to the police department themselves. And when you talk with them and you see what they're all about and you actually go there and you ride along with them, and you know how they are functioning in that building. Yeah, it's, it's older. It's not state-of-the-art new. I think everybody would prefer that. But they are telling us they would rather stay where they are and grow where they are in a location that's much, much better than this one. And if we think we have problems now with recruiting and retention and bringing our officers up to the numbers that we need them, let's forget about annexation. Let's forget about the, I mean, let's think about the here and now. We're down 22 officers now. And if we go against their best instincts and their common sense and say, we don't really care what you say, we think you're gonna be better off here, we think it's gonna be better off for the community, so, let's just move you back here against their will. I'm not sure how well that's gonna go for this community. So that is one of my primary reasons why I oppose the showers as not being a suitable relocation for the headquarters, which has withstood a flood and has been refurbished from that flood and they still function during that time in that building. And they will continue to function in that building as the disciplined and well-trained and good police department that we know them to be that we need to bring up to the numbers that this city deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Sure, I'll give it a, I'll give it a shot. Um, there's, there's so much to consider and digest here. Um, I just wanted to mention a few things that I, I think haven't been mentioned. Um, police is just one part of public safety, and to many people, it's not even the most important part. We heard earlier tonight from Renee Miller, who's on the Community Advisory on Public Safety Commission, and um, they did a, a survey and found that uh, many, many people consider um, housing to be actually the number one concern they have as far as public safety. Um, so in that context, um, the police, while vitally important, is, is just one way that um, the city of Bloomington uh, can carry out its responsibility towards its residents as far as public safety. And in that context, I think it is a good idea to have the police officers um, closer in proximity to uh, the other departments of the city, uh, closer to, um, well, the fire department with the community outreach um, 
specialists that they have on their staff closer to um, community and family resources, which uh, coordinates a lot of homelessness response, uh, closer to um, the various offices whose rules the, the police uh, help to enforce. So uh, I, I do see that as a benefit. Um, I did want to respond to uh, Officer Paul Post's comment. I think it was his comment or, yeah, or possibly um, Detective Rogers, but uh, I never settle for something just because the mayor uh, told me to vote for something. Anybody who knows uh, how many questions I ask um, knows that that is not something I would ever do. So I do not feel like um, I have to approve this just because uh, it has been brought forward. Um, I also want to mention that the, the fire department has been located um, next to the Beeline Trail for 18 months now, and to my knowledge, there have not been any uh, accidents or negative interactions with pedestrians and bicyclists uh, at that location. And that is a location from which emergency vehicles travel, uh, which is largely not the case uh, for a police station. Um, while I, I, I appreciate greatly the comments of the FOP and the efforts they have made to, um, to do a, a practical estimate of renovation costs at their facility, the fact is there has not been a full professional evaluation of what it would cost to renovate the current BPD station. Um, they, the FOP was not in a position where they could really ask for such an estimate, so I don't blame them. I'm just saying, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the professionals that have been engaged um, were focused on showers, and, uh, but also um, did an evaluation, a uh, 30,000 foot evaluation of um, the current BPD station and uh, came up with, with figures. So that's the professional um, uh, uh, perspective. And I think several people have said, I'm not an architect. Yes, I'm not an architect either. But we did have architects look at it. Um, and so that holds value for me. Um, as for the, the rank and file of the police officers, I, I definitely respect them and I, I am very grateful for their service. Um, as, uh, as I walk through the current police station and as I walk through the um, showers building, the West Showers building, I am struck at how much nicer the environment is at West Showers. Um, I know that um, the, it would be a big change for police officers to move there. And change is hard and change is, is um, scary. Not, not to say that police officers aren't much braver than I am, but um, in general, just human nature is that we don't like change. Um, so uh, the, the survey done by FOP, you have to consider that it was not in context. It did not provide um, any of the, the background information that we have. Uh, and um, I think that, that that needs to be considered when we look at the responses of the rank and file. Um, so those are some of my considerations. I would like to take another week um, because there's so much information to digest. Um, I also want to say that um, the cheapest option is not always the best option. So even if the um, even if it is uh, less expensive to renovate at the current BPD station, that's not my only consideration here. Um, I want to look to the long term. Uh, and it, under the current mayor, there will be no expansion of the, um, the space for police, and I know that they need more space. Um, and I'd rather not just wait it out. I'd rather move forward with that. So these are some of my thoughts, and I hope that we postpone and take another week to consider. Thank you. Thank you. 
Additional comments? Councilmember Rosenbarger. Thank you. I'll just weigh in briefly. Um, I prepared some thoughts, but they are the same as my um, comments from the last two meetings, so I don't want to be redundant and just say I support postponing since we are one member short tonight. Thank you. Additional comments? Councilmember Volan. Well, uh, this is a complex situation. I'm not as confident as uh, a couple of my colleagues about um, what the decision is, which is why I certainly want to move to postpone and support another week. Um, I you know, certainly feel it should take more time. Um, I want to point out that uh, the administration wanted us to make this decision in two weeks, and they wanted us to make the decision tied to the actual approval of the bond itself. It was all part of the same legislative cycle. And uh, I hope we can all see what happens when we try to, let's use this very popular word tonight, shoehorn in complicated legislation into a very short period of time. Um, we might have avoided this like Brinks personship that we're uh, facing now because there's a, a deadline for acquiring a particular building. Um, I want to point out as an aside that this council bears some responsibility in the way this decision is being made. We don't always follow up on the legacies of our decisions, like I said about the Cuba resolution tonight and prior resolutions that we fought, we've forgotten about. I want to point out that had there been a public safety committee on this council with a public safety chair, had there been a point person, that chair designated by this body specifically to focus on issues regarding public safety, the administration might have involved that member and that committee in these discussions several months ago when we would have been able to save a lot of the time that we're spending now in this meeting, in these meetings. But the majority of this council eliminated the council's public safety committee at the beginning of 2022. This is yet another reason why bodies like ours use committees for precisely this kind of complex problem solving. So here we are taking valuable, expensive, regular session time debating these details in arrears. So that word shoehorn, I want to address the word. It's been used by several people tonight, the administration, the FOP, some of my colleagues, to characterize moving the police department or keeping it in place. The FOP is concerned that we'd be shoehorning them into showers. It's absurd in its face, or I wouldn't be expressing dismay at the carrying cost of nearly half the building that will go unused indefinitely. But Deputy Mayor Carmichael used the same term to describe the existing HQ site. She called it landlocked, hard up against the park. But the new location the administration is proposing is far more landlocked, hard up against the Beeline Trail and 8th Street, which is a glorified part of the City Hall parking lot where the city is proud to host farmers markets. The thing is, we can build on top of parking lots. Their parking lots are land banks. One of the key insights the FOP had for why they, they are in favor of staying in place is that they don't need wide swaths of parking. They, they use primary tool of their profession is the automobile, which is mobile. It's in the name. If it came to either staying in place in headquarters and moving cars around to offsite places, that was doable and preferable to a location that they saw as more landlocked, that they see as landlocked. Uh, the only argument against them staying in place there is that future expansions on top of the south parking lot would be new construction and, uh, and that would be even more expensive than what we're spending now, but there would at least be no land acquisition cost. How long are we going to be expected to carry the fallow space that's going to be in this building? Let's say it's a third. Let's say it's not close to half the space. Although I, again, dispute that definition of common space, not somehow counting in the purchase price. Um, we have an example of this already with the Trades District Garage. It's being used at 10% of its capacity. And we spent millions of dollars on it. We're carrying that cost in the form of bonds. We're going to be carrying about $4 million uh, in showers building, minus about Let's, let's say it's a $444,000 a year in uh, lease payments for at least a, f a couple of years. We might be able to reduce that by a good chunk. Uh, and you know that $4 million, though, or that $3 million, whatever that it winds up being, could go to fund other capital projects. And we know that we have other priorities. 
Um, this isn't just about the police. I think they know that. It's not just about the fire department either. I think the fire department definitely knows that. I think individual departments have to know they're part of the whole. Uh, I mean, uh, so I appreciate the administration's effort to synthesize the city, to, to bring the, de the departments together that should be closer together. I, at least everyone, I hope, recognizes that we're, as a council, trying to synthesize all of this complicated decision making and make the decision that provides the most optimal solution. It's not gonna be the favorite or the best, it's gonna be the most optimal that we can come up with. But we have to consider also that the fleet division of public works, we just heard from a, the union leader tonight saying that the mechanics that repair those vehicles that would need to be moved in order to make those, those, those departments, fire and police functional, is less than half capacity. We all, we're all in this together and we uh, forget fleet, among others, at our peril. But through the committee, we established a low end cost for a potential plan B. I'm not saying we should build it. I'm not saying it's my favorite. I'm just saying we, we at least know what the low end is. It's gonna take some due diligence. We'd have to ask our, uh, I mean, the staff who would do uh, internal renovation. We wouldn't need to hire an outside contractor if, if what the FOP is saying is the best way to go. We could build a couple of walls, well, like we do with all our other buildings. We have staff to do that. We'd have to get an estimate from them. Um, the administration's estimate I consider to be the high end. Okay, we have a range now. And that range is significant. I mean, it's a $7 million range. It's the difference between plan B being more affordable by a clearly more affordable or not. Um, no matter where one puts a building that regularly uses sirens, there's gonna be a neighbor that's gonna be unhappy about it. I am sure that the people who live on Washington Lincoln Street are not happy about the, the uh, travels of police and uh, fire down their streets uh, when the sirens have to go off. But that's also gonna be true for uh, the neighbor just across from Rogers Street, uh, the people who live in the apartment building that will be built uh, immediately to the south of the Showers Building next to the Johnson Creamery. Uh, that's really more reason to review why and how often sirens and speeding are used by those divisions. There's a cost-benefit ratio that we've talked about in this chamber before about widening roads to accommodate the biggest fire trucks when it turns out that more people are killed proportionally by car accidents who are driving fast on wide roads than they are by uh, roads too narrow for fire trucks to get to them. Uh, by, by people in fires altogether, more people are killed by cars than fire. The same is going to be true for police sirens. We can't just say uh, that police or police speeding. Uh, I mean, th uh, this is an argument for the showers building. Uh, yes, it's not uh, what they're accustomed to, but uh, we, you know, we, we should always be reviewing how fast our public safety cars go. We have to balance the. I mean, they have a different challenge. Like when they're speeding, it's because someone's life is at risk, in the same way that uh, when a fire is going. Um, so. These are some of the things that, I mean, like, I could still go either way on it, which is why I needed this conversation tonight. I needed to know, I needed to get feedback from the administration. At last, we've been able to, everyone to present their findings, we could figure out where the, uh, the crux of the issue is. I still think that it comes down to uh, cost, that um, we do have other priorities I, I want to see, let me put it this way, I want to see the showers building acquired. I think it'd be great. I question whether we should do it with public safety dollars, dollars that are earmarked specifically for public safety. Uh, I question whether we should be we were acquiring so much. Even with annexation, I don't know what we possibly can do to grow our department. I mean, again, in my first 10 years, the previous mayor announced in 2004 that the uh, department needed to increase uh, by 16 officers. And the fastest at which the city could hire officers under previous times, pre-pandemic times, was two officers a year net. So how long is it gonna take us to climb back up to a number appropriate to our population? Uh, it's not gonna be five a year net. It's not gonna be 10 a year net. There's enough room right now 
in the existing headquarters to accommodate our force for several years to come. Uh, so, uh, you know, while I'm compelled by the prospect of Showers Plaza, the west side of this building, being attached to this building, uh, I also don't know that now's the time. And I also question who else would buy it? Who else is going to buy it? IU had the north side of Showers. They eventually abandoned it. They found that it was not the right experiment, too far from their campus. They wanted to be more consolidated with the, the people they put in that building. Now the county has it. Uh, office space is going begging post-pandemic. There's not much need for office space. As, I mean, let's posit that CFC has kept up the showers building. It's hard to argue with the quality of Cook's preservation and restoration work in any building they've done. So, granted, that building over there has been well kept. But where's the market for it? We're the best market for it. I think eventually we may want to buy it. Maybe that time is now, maybe not. Uh, but I don't think it's as urgent uh, as this issue calls for. And I need more information to really be able to, uh, to call it either way. So I'm going to move to postpone. And I hope my colleagues will support the postponement for another week. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? If, if not, I'll just finish up. Um, thank you. I really appreciate my colleagues' discussion tonight and everyone who participated in this discussion. This is a big price tag, um, and it merits the kind of in-depth conversations that we've had here. I especially want to um, express my appreciation to the ad hoc committee that formed to dig into these numbers more deeply. I think the report was very, very helpful um, and helped illuminate parts of this conversation. Um, so here's some of my thinking. Um, when we passed an increase in the ED lit in the local income tax, um, we did so with hearing some resistance from those who understandably didn't want their taxes raised. But I think that was a right decision. And I think the choice to emphasize investments in public safety was also the right decision. One of the things, comments we heard earlier tonight is that public safety is one of the most fundamental functions of municipal government. And I agree with that. Um, I also, I've toured showers, and I think it's, it's an amazingly impressive building. Um, I think the care and, and attention that CFC has taken in both in the original restoration that they did almost 20 years ago um, and in the care they have taken since then is impressive. I think it, it is an impressive building that lends itself well to office space. So I think that's, that's true. That said, we've also established that the way for the, I'm all, well, actually, let me back up a second. I'm also interested in the idea of a municipal government complex. Um, I think that the idea of having co-location of services or a central area where citizens and residents can come um, and interact with their government in whatever ways that means um, is also a very compelling vision. All right. That said, one of the things we heard tonight is that if we are to purchase showers, the only way to do it is with the proceeds of this bond, which will force us to put public safety in that space. So that begets the question in my mind of whether or not that makes sense. Um, again, public safety is too fundamental. It is too important and too central to what we do um, to move it or to, to otherwise force it into a circumstance which will make it more difficult to do its job. I still have concerns about ingress and egress for this. We've, we've talked about that, and I've honestly not heard any compelling response uh, about how we will address that issue. I've heard, well, if you just make this one way, it should go faster, and it should, go, it should be fine. Um, but I don't think we've adequately addressed that issue. Um, I am concerned about the impact on neighborhoods. I was meeting with the board members from the Near West Side neighborhood last, last night, Tuesday night. Um, and I got an earful about their concerns about what it would mean to have public safety located nearby. And they were concerns that I, I think I, half ex I didn't have any particular expectations of what I would hear, but I thought it would have been reasonable to say, yes, we'd love to have public safety located near us. They expressed concerns about the kind of 24-hour traffic pattern that would result from having police so nearby a very dense neighborhood. 
that begets the question in my mind about what additional strategies we need and what additional opportunities we need to, in, to gather public comment on this move and how it will impact neighborhoods. Um, one thing we didn't talk very much about, to, I don't know if we talked at all about it tonight, um, I actually have concerns about co-location of public safety and, and the office of the mayor here. Um, I, having both of those functions located in the same place um, certainly can produce synergies and produce those spontaneous collaborations that happen when you share a coffee pot or share a kitchen. Um, but I also think they present concerns in times of emergency. So in the, in the case of a catastrophic event that affected this building, what would be our plan if both the office of the mayor and the center of our government were impacted and public safety, police and fire were impacted what is our plan? What would, how would we respond to that? Um, I've heard, uh, I've posed that question a couple times outside these meetings and I've, I've had responses like, well, we haven't had a tornado here um, in ages and we haven't had an earthquake here in ages. And that's certainly true. Um, but planning for the, all the planning that we do for things like that is worthless right up until the moment it's priceless. Uh, and so I think the notion of co-location of services actually does concern me a little bit. Um, until I hear more about an emergency, a, a plan for those kinds of contingencies. Um, this is expensive, this is complicated, and for that reason I would support a postponement. Um, and I would support taking this up next week when, when we have a bit more information. Um, that concludes my comments, but I do have the question now. We have an amendment before us um, do we need a vote on that amendment? Do we need that amendment, Mr. Lucas? No, if, if, uh, <clears throat> if a member wishes to make a mo motion to postpone, uh, if the council can postpone ordinance 2206 until uh, next week's regular session. Any amendments uh, that so are on the table So it postpones the bundle, yes. so to speak. I move postponement of ordinance. Appropriation ordinance 2206. 23, 2206. 2206, correct. 2206. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the motion to postpone beyond what we've had? Point of information, is there a time or date to which? To the next regular session. To January 25th. Okay. Correct. Any, dis any further discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll on the motion to postpone? Council member. Councilmember Sandberg? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Smith? Yes. Volan? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. And Rosenberger? Yes. That passes 8 0. Thank you. The further consideration of appropriation ordinance 2206 is postponed until next week's regular session on January 25th. Thank you. And thank you to all those who have been part of this conversation this evening. So with that, we'll move into legislation for first readings. Madam President, I move that appropriation ordinance 2206 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. 2301. Oh, okay. I beg your pardon, 2301. To be introduced. I will, I'll, do, I'll make the motion again. Uh, <laughs> it's getting late. Uh, I move that ordinance 2301 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 2301 to amend the City of Bloomington zoning maps by rezoning a 0.57 acre of property from mixed use neighborhood scale to mixed use medium scale regarding 300, 302, and 314 West First Street, St. Real Estate LLC petitioner. The synopsis is as follows. Ordinance 2301 rezones 0.57 acres from mixed use neighborhood scale to mixed use medium scale. Okay. Uh, pardon me. Okay. 
Um, we'll refer this to the regular session coming up next on January 25th. With that, we will move into our second period of pu public comment. This is for items not on the agenda this evening. If you would, if you're in chambers and have comment, please approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, could you make our announcement on Zoom? Yes, if there are members of the public who want to offer comment, please use the raise hand feature to let us know. You can find that in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. I'm just seeing one here in chambers. I'm seeing none, any on Zoom? I'm seeing none on not, Zoom? Not at the moment, no. Okay. Welcome. If you would, please state your name for the record, and then you'll have five minutes. Uh, good evening, members of the council. I'm Vaughn Welch, and I absolutely promise to be brief. Um, I just want to make a brief comment about the CBCI that was introduced in the last week. And for context, I'm the president, one of the two co-presidents of Constellation Stage and Screen. For those not familiar, we're the nonprofit that, with contract to the city, runs the John Waldron Arts Center as a community arts space. And first, I just really want to applaud the city. I think like any collaboration of real consequence, uh, our work with the city involves a good deal of effort from both sides. And when I see the city putting the effort into the Waldron, the Buskirk, Chumley, and other places supporting the arts, I really want to thank the city for that. And similarly, I appreciate the uh, initiative behind the creation of a, um, a nonprofit to help streamline that. I would be the you know, the last to, to say it's not without challenges in our collaboration. That being said, I want to say that the uh, nonprofit caught me by surprise as a board member of Constellation. Uh, it's making me uncomfortable in my ability to lead that board and understand what is the, the future going to evolve. Our, our current contract with the city, the ink is barely dry just a few months ago, and now we're in our first year and facing another bit of uncertainty. I really uh, would appreciate more information on this, and I just want to thank the council uh, for their thoughtfulness on these issues and any help forthcoming in understanding how this nonprofit is going to benefit us, is going to change things for us, what are the trade offs. And then finally, I just want to offer if myself and my colleagues at Constellation, and I expect others in the arts community, can be of any help to the council in understanding our side of this collaboration and our advice on this matter. Uh, please consider us uh, available at your pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And it was Mr. Welsh. I think I got that correct. 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 Thank you. I'm not seeing any additional public comment here in chambers. Anything on Zoom, Mr. Lucas? No, I don't believe so. Okay. Seeing no further comment, let's take up matters of council schedule. I have no, no items to note tonight. Um, we'll have a regular session next Wednesday uh, on the 25th. Very well. Anything else for the good of the order? If there are no objections, we are adjourned. <laughs>